Anybody at home watching, let me know if you can hear me loud and clear right now. This is the only official 12 tribes breakdown. You can't get this anywhere else because this is ISUPK home of the truth. That's it. That's right. Amen. Off. I don't know how you did it. You might have stepped on the, the plugs or something. You know what I'm so whatever this is plugged into, we can Now, why are you filming? This is just for all the. No, no, no. I need you to focus on just this. All right. This is the only. This is this is the only thing you focus on right now. And so all the people at home, this lecture was supposed to be for a twenty dollar donation. You know what I'm saying? So if y'all watching this on cross the line right now, you know what I'm saying? Feel free to make that twenty dollar donation to the ISUPK. You know what I'm saying? Right. Support this school, support this troop. You feel me? Right. And if y'all listening at home, make sure y'all share this too everywhere. How y'all feeling tonight? Y'all got any good? Everybody had a safe trip? They delayed my flight like six hours. I'm telling you. I almost lost my damn mind at that airport. 
Alright. Here's another thing too. I need y'all to have some attention spans. Alright. I don't know how long this is gonna be. We booked four hours. I try to condense hundreds of years of information and about 50 years worth of research into one small lecture. Alright. So bear with me. I'm gonna try to make this as interesting as possible, a little bit interactive. And if there's any time, maybe we'll do a QA or you know what I'm saying, maybe cross the line, because we're gonna go right into cross the line radio right after this, all right. Hey, big ups to you, sis, for the donation. Once again, if, if y'all can, if y'all in the chat, y'all can hear me. Everybody, everybody who can hear me loud and clear, give me a one in the chat. Yeah, Ah, right, we getting ones, most high in Christ. We're gonna get this thing underway in a minute. Uh you can click that little dollar sign. There's gonna be a dollar sign you could donate right into the chat. If you can't do it from the dollar sign, make a donation at isubk.com. We appreciate the support. The lecture was supposed to be for a $20 donation. If y'all don't got to do what you can. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and get this thing underway. Uh, can you mind hitting the lights back then? Bubba Kasha. Most high in Christ. I hope the screen's clear enough for y'all at home. Give me a one if y'all can see the screen nice and clear. So now, once again, this is a very controversial subject. You know what I'm saying? And it's mainly controversial because there are people who are unlearned and have not studied under Commander General Yohan and I as you became. You understand? But what was passed down to us, and this is why this lecture is so important, is because I'm going to tell you something. When, when this chart was given to head priest Ariya, it was a vision. We didn't have any of this archaeology. You know what I'm saying? Like, like all this came later on in time after head priest Yeshaya and them started digging into the archives and pulling this up. Because I'm sure if y'all were watching the class of General Mahaim, he broke down the scripture, the earth shall help the woman. You understand? 
and the earth opened up and swallowed up all them lies from the dragon. Meaning, well, all that archaeology that starts coming out. Now, me personally, all I needed when I came into the truth was Genesis 49. I didn't need a damn thing else. I saw Genesis 49, and if you were spiritual, brother, you understand? Like, like if you could really understand these scriptures, then you're going to see that that's us clear as day. You understand? So now, what comes down to is that all this archaeology, you understand, is just backing up exactly what was exactly what was said since 1969. Right. So, you know what I'm saying? So I want to say, Yahweh Shem Yahweh to all my brothers, you understand? Yahweh Shem Yahweh by Shem Yahweh Shah to all my sisters. This is the ISUPK, One West, under Commanding General Yohanna. And I did clap it up. Definitely. I want to definitely thank all the generals I harass on a daily basis, you understand, for breakdowns on Hebrew counseling, you know what I'm saying, all that, you understand. Captain Zarya, because I was able to study at his foot in order to do lectures with him, so this was a breeze putting this together, I promise you that. You know what I'm saying? And Captain Mawakwad and every brother that operates under him from Captain DeBar Moth all the way on down, you know what I'm saying? So we're going to get into it. Give me the next slide. Next slide. So now, a lot of you are familiar with the curses, you understand? That everything that would befall upon Israel if we did not hearken on to his word, if we didn't listen to him. So a lot of times they try to turn around, they try to say that Hispanics and Native Indians and the Indians of the Americas, they do not fit the curses, which is a damn lie. I promise you that. And we about to prove that today. You understand? That's one of the major identifying markers as to who we are today is the curses that the Lord put on us, unfortunately. Unfortunately, we shouldn't have had to go through none of this, you understand? But it's cursed shall we be in the city, cursed shall we be in the field. Our sons and daughters were given on to another people, and we long for them all the day long. Now, I'm going to be paraphrasing because I'm trying to move through this material. Y'all should know these scriptures. We're in Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter right now. That we served our enemies in hunger, in thirst, in nakedness, in want of all things. Yokes of iron that were put around our neck. You understand? I can make sure that y'all phones is on mute as well, all right? So now, that the Lord brought a nation of fierce countenance from afar to the end of the earth, you understand, which destroyed us. And they do not regard the person of young nor the person of old. Let me get the next slide. I need you just focused on these slides right now, all right? So now, of course, everybody knows into Egypt shall we go again with ships. You understand? Now, what a lot of people don't know is because our history, our history was blurred, was blacked out, whited out, blurred out. Right. Is that the North American Indians went into slavery with ships, starting with the Taino Indians, the Mexican Indians, the Gadai, so-called North American Indians. And I dug it up for this lecture. Right. And you better find it out today. So this is Deuteronomy 28. Y'all know this. Next slide. So now this is a book right here that the blood stay pure. This was a sister who went and did some research. Now, remember, one of the other curses is what? We would lose our identity. And also that we would be a byword, you understand, a proverb to all nations. Next slide. So now, what's the number one thing that they like to say? Oh, all the 12 tribes of Negroes. I don't disagree with you. I don't disagree with you in the slightest bit. The problem is, is that there's only two arguments that I hear against the 12 tribe chart. One of them is colorism. It's only slaves argue about color. Only slaves argue about complexion. You go over there to Ethiopian, there's light-skinned Ethiopians, there's dark-skinned Ethiopians. Right. And neither one of them disagree that they're the same people. Neither one of them fight with each other. Neither one of them try to not support each other. You understand? Well, because we were divided and conquered because of our complexion, we do that. But we're about to find out is that in this book in 2013, she turns around and starts tracing the origins that it traced back to medieval Italy where it was a classification of skin color, not race. So when you drop down, it says that in Portuguese colony of Brazil, Indians were called Negros de Terra, meaning Negroes of the land. The Indians were called Negroes originally before they were being called Indians. You understand? That whole lie about Columbus landing in India, or that he didn't know when he discovered America, we're going to destroy that tonight too. Columbus was a Shephardic Jew. He was a Jewish he knew where the hell he was going because of Ezra's. We're going to get into that. Let me get the next slide. So now, what you're also going to see is that there was laws that she started to break out. That the closest Indian cities were guilty of a murder. 
So at this conference that she had, she turns around and she shares that in October of 1665, according to Henning statutes at large, the laws of Virginia, if an Englishman was murdered, a.k.a. the devil in the earth, the so-called white man, the closest Indian town would be held accountable for the crime. So if they was doing that to the Gaddax, who else did they do that to? They did that to Rosewood. They did that to Black Wall Street. We fit everything. Everything that happened to the so-called Negro inside of America happened to the other so-called Negro inside of America, a.k.a. the North American Indian, right. a.k.a. Right. the Puerto Ricans. You right. understand? A.k.a. the Mexican Indians. Right. These were laws that they created. Give me the next slide. So now, authorities in 1860 assumed that the Nanciaticos had committed a murder. They, they reenacted Henning statutes and ordered all children under 12 be endangered to the English as servants until the age of 24. The Indians were forcibly to, uh, excuse me, the Indians were forbidden to return to their home or they shall be transported beyond the sea to England or some of the islands there and bound for slavery for seven years. Don't tell me we ain't going to slavery with slave ships. Right. And that's only one instance. That's only when the English was doing it to us. Next slide. The transatlantic slave trade, histories of the transatlantic slave trade typically focus on those enslaved in North America and they overlook its southern counterpart, meaning South America. Now, what, what a lot of fake Israelites try to do, and I say fake Israelites, because just because you know you Israel don't mean you got the truth. You understand? Right, right. So now, what they try to do is they try to turn around and say, well, it was the Negroes that was brought to South America. Those are the Israelites. Those that were in the maroon colonies. They don't understand that that slavery started with us first. So now, was there slave imports from Africa overwhelmingly taken to America and the Caribbean? Absolutely. Were they put in areas such as Brazil, Colombia, and Bolivia? Absolutely. Next slide. You got it? So now, yet, not unlike North America, slavery existed in South America even before African slave importation. Meaning what? Slavery started in America with the North American Indians. It started in 1492 when Columbus sailed the ocean blue. You understand? After Christopher Columbus's discovery of the Americas in 1492, much of South America was divided between the Spanish and the Portuguese. When the Europeans arrived in South America, they enslaved the native inhabitants and used them as free. What happened here? I hear you. What happened to my speaker though? I hear you. Y'all hear me? No sweat. I think it might be this microphone. We got another microphone. The battery's dead in this. Let me see here. Boom. Take that. All right, here we go. So now, what you're going to see is that we were forced to go into mines and pick cotton and sugar cane and tobacco. You understand? They did the same thing to us. Next slide. So now, we don't have certain depictions because there was no photographs. All we have is murals. But they have murals dating back from the 1500s, 1600s, all the way up into the 1900s, portraying what our slavery looked like. Where we were lynched and we were hung. We were whipped. We were forced to convert to Christianity and forced to mine their gold for them. Next slide. The transatlantic slave trade. Native American slavery is a piece of history of slavery that has been glossed over. Let me tell you something, man. The United States right now is putting out textbooks that call the transatlantic slave trade the transatlantic migration. There's so much history that they're ashamed of or that they don't want people to know of because they want to seem as though this that is righteous nation that they don't tell you, you understand, but this professor did. This is from Linford D. Fisher, associated professor at Brown University. Between 1492 and 1880, between 2 and 5.5 million Native Americans were enslaved in the Americas in addition to 12.5 million African slaves. Now, of course, when it says Africans, we're talking about Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. Now, when it talks about the Indians, it's talking about all the Indians in the Caribbean, Simeon, Manessa, Ephraim, so on and so forth, all the way on down to Issachar, our brothers and sisters, you understand? So now, while natives had been forced into slavery and servitude as early as 1636, it was not until King Philip's war that natives were enslaved at large numbers. And then what did they start doing? 
During the English War, New England colonies routinely shipped Native American slaves to Barbados, Bermuda, Jamaica, Spain, Tangiers, North Africa. You understand? Africans were slave masters too, man. Stop trying to love them hammocks. You got a problem with that? Turn this lecture off right now. Walk out, do whatever you want. You understand? Next slide. And now, the reason why that's so important too is because, listen, they destroyed all of our people. They hid this history. Listen, we just gonna get into it. English authorities focused first on disarming natives, either by selling guns turned in by surrenderers or prohibiting them from bearing arms. That's the same thing that they did to Judah. You understand? They try to forbid us from bearing arms. You have a look at the major cities, right, that have the strictest gun laws. It's where the most black and Hispanics is at because they don't want to arm us, man. You understand? Well, that's the same thing that they did with Gad. So now it says, in addition, Native communities. Now, once again, I might be skipping over some information, but like I said, there's a lot of information. I'm trying to move through this right now. So I'm going to leave this up. If y'all at home, y'all want to pause the screen, y'all do all that. Y'all here reading it? Go ahead and get down. All right. In addition, Native communities were asked to pay an annual tribute. You understand? So meaning they would tax us. They would pay tribute. They enslaved us in any single way imaginable and possible. And that's what the law said. The law said that they would lend to us and we would not lend to them. We'd have to go to them for want of all things. Next slide. So now the shadow of Native American enslavement in New England extends into the 18th century and beyond, Fisher says. There were no records of people petitioning for freedom in the 1740s who were the descendants of Native Americans first enslaved during King Philip's War. In the study, he writes, small legal loopholes and dishonest practices on the ground ensured in many cases, limited term service continued into lifelong and even heritable slavery. This is what they did to us with Jim Crow. You understand? This is what they did to us in reconstruction in the South with slavery. This is the 13th Amendment all over again. This is sharecropping. They found ways to create laws and different avenues in order to keep the Native Americans enslaved. So now it says, a law passed the same year by Rhode Island General Assembly seemed to surface to outlaw Indian slavery. But Fisher notes in, in practice that other laws ensured that Native surrenderers were disposed of for the benefit of the colony, man. They would murder us. They would enslave us. Read on. Oh, excuse me. Next slide. Fisher also argues that there was an ideological component to enslaving Native Americans among colonists. There was a presumption involving the innate inferiority of Natives. This is the same thing they say about our brother Judah. You understand? They tried to make Natives inside the Americas inferior the same way they try to say we're dumb, we're lazy, this, this, that, and the third. When realistically, the white man's inferior to us. What could he beat us at? Not a goddamn thing. You know what I'm saying? Ain't a damn thing that he's better than us at. And now, this prejudice that they had, mind you, this is why they say that we would run around naked. This is why they say, they try to say we didn't have no government structure or we were uncivilized when you're about to find the complete opposite. Next slide. So now, this is also extremely important. This is an article that was put up. This is a brother who believed he was Hispanic. And the problem is that you got so many people who think that Hispanics you understand, though, the Hispanics, rather, that we speak about are the conquistadors. They think we're talking about the Europeans. Listen, a Hispanic brother that we're talking about is a descendant of the North American Indians, whether it be in Mexico, whether it be in the Caribbean. Right. And now, this same brother having the last name Cortez or Hernandez, so on and so forth, is no different than a brother having the last name Washington. So now they found this brother in New Mexico. So now this is, this is Lenny Trujillo. And he made a startling discovery when he began researching his descendant from one of New Mexico's pioneering Hispanic families. One of his ancestors was a slave. I didn't know about New Mexico's slave trade, so I was just stunned. So he didn't know. He thought he was Hispanic. He thought he was from Spain. Come to find out, his family was Indians that was enslaved, and they gave him the Hispanic name. They forced Spanish on him. So now he turns around and says, one of the many Latinos who are finding out ancestral connections to a flourishing slave trade on the blood-soaked frontier known as the American Southwest. Their captive forebears, you understand, were Native Americans, slaves also known as Janeiros. So now this is the name that they were called for the slaves. And they start talking about the bondage that they were in in Mexico and New Mexico. 
The revelations have prompted some painful personal reckonings over identity and heritage, but they have also been fueled, you understand, politically charged to debate on what it means to be Hispanic and Native American. We're discovering that our history, excuse me, we're discovering things that complicate the hell out of our history, demanding that we reject the myths that we've been taught. We've been taught lies, man. You understand? You don't educate a slave. They told us that we were our slave masters. They told us that these were our people. This was our culture. Everything that Judah went through, you understand, Ephraim, Manasseh, and Issachar went through all the way on down. We all shared the same pain. It wasn't like one was hurt more than the other. You understand? And that makes us brothers even in that instant. You understand? And that's something that we got to identify with. We got to identify that we all wear in the same jersey. We're on the same team, and we have a common enemy. We have somebody who's trying to score against us, man, and that's keeping us oppressed inside the barrios, keeping us oppressed inside the ghetto. You understand? Making this look like Chirac. Well, I drove down the block of 79. I was like, this is the goddamn jungle. And it's like that in Newark. It's like that in Spanish Harlem. You understand? It's like that in well, Roxbury is getting gentrified right now, but it's like that in Worcester. You understand? It's like that around the earth, wherever we are. So now, meaning that, you got Hispanics who need to wake up to their identity the same way you got Judites who got to realize that they're not American. We all need to realize who we are. And that's the importance of the 12 tribe chart. That's the importance of this lecture because we have to come into who we are. You understand? We are the 12 tribes of Israel. Next slide, please. So now, what you're going to see is that we all know about the history of lynchings that took place with Judah. Next slide. We all know that the white man is the devil and he takes pleasure in murdering us. You understand? Right, right, right. Next slide. But what we don't know is that this right here was a Taino. You understand? Some people say he was an Arawak. All I know is that this was a cacique. You understand? Meaning a chief over in the Tainos. And this brother right here, they turned around and they're trying to first forcibly convert him to Christianity. And he turned around and said, is there going to be more white Christians in heaven? He said, yeah. He said, then I'll go to hell. And then they burnt him at the stake. The same way that they lynched us, the same way they, you understand, the same way they did it to Judah, they did it to us. All of us went through the same things. Next slide. So now this is the unknown history of Latino lynchings. We all know that they did this to Judah, Benjamin, Levi. What we don't know is that they were doing this to Ephraim. They were doing this to Manasseh. They were doing this, you understand, to Issachar. Don't ever try to tell me the Mexicans ain't our brothers, man. Next slide. These lynchings took place in the southwest U.S. in present-day Texas, California, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Nevada. These killings were carried out by vigilantes and other masked men as a form of street justice. Tell me that don't sound like the KKK. You understand? So now, these killings were carried out, excuse me, these killings became so bad that the Mexican government lodged official complaints to the U.S. Council in Mexico, given that its region of the U.S. was at one time Mexican land, and it was shared with the Indians. So now what you're going to find out is that they said F us too. You understand? As always. Next slide. Delgado goes on to cite that only some U.S. historians have written about these Latino lynchings and have pointed out that they occurred due to racial prejudice and protection of turf and Yankee nationalism. So now give me the next slide. What you're gonna find out is that what the reason why we don't know that this happened to us is because one, there's only a handful of American scholars who covered it, which means what? It was other Latinos and Hispanics who were covering it. So as a result of them covering it, it was written in another language. It was written in Spanish. It was written in Portuguese. So we didn't even have access to it. And once again, this is another point in history that was glossed over just like the North American Indians going on slave ships, just like the Tainos going on slave ships with Columbus. This is all history that they don't teach us because once again, you do not educate a slave. Next slide. Further exploration reveals that these lynchings were not only edited and minimized outright, but were also ignored or misrepresented to primary accounts in community newspapers being written in Spanish. Since very few mainstream historians read Spanish or consulted with these records, they were left to flounder. And it got down to the point where our own people ain't believe it. It got down to the point where we started to just think that this was myth and folklore. 
It's like that. What's that rapper? B.O.B. getting high thinking the slave trade doesn't exist. You understand? It's the same thing. We start thinking that the transatlantic slave trade was a myth. Well, that's the same thing that happened with these lynchings. Next slide. So now, once again, the Encomi end the system. This is another term for Indian slavery, which is another reason that we don't know that the Indians were enslaved. You look this up. This was something that started off just like sharecropping. They would come, talk to a chief, give him a little bit of resources so that this way he'd be able to go and cut sugarcane. That this way he'd be able to go and mine gold. And then as a result, who would reap all the benefits of it? The Spaniards, the Portuguese, the Dutch. You understand? The devil in the earth, the so-called white man. And then eventually, this turned directly into slavery. You understand? Ultimately forced the natives into slavery. This is what the Encomienda system did. Once again, it's no different than Jim Crow. It's no different than what they do to us with the, with, with the amendments in, in, in the damn prison system. You understand? They got brothers right now uh, 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 sewing uniforms for the military for 70 cents a day. Next slide, please. So now, kill the Indian and save the man. You take a look at this. This was North American Indian boarding school. They've been separating our children from us since the beginning of time. It started with the slave ships. Now, we know all about the ice raids that's going on right now. But what we don't know is that not only did they separate us on the slave ships, not only did they do that, but they created boarding schools where they would rip our children away from us. And look at the first thing that they did. They would cut our damn head, man. They tried to take away our identity. They knew braids was our culture. You understand? And they, what they would do is try to hit the reset button. Look how their spirit shifted. You understand? After all the beatings, all the molestation. You understand? Next slide. Over the next several decades, the Carzile served as a model for nearly 150 such schools that opened around. Like the 1887 Dawes Act that relocated Native American land or the Bureau of Indian Affairs 1902 haircut order specifying that men with long hair couldn't receive rations. What is rations? Your food. Survival. So if you do not want to starve to death, you have to cut your hair. You understand? And once again, that's why what General Muhammad said is so important, man. Your hair is a declaration of your freedom, of your independence. You understand? Straight up and down. Captain Yonk, this is no shade at you and your new haircut. I want you to know. You know what I'm saying? You can get down however you want. You know what I'm saying? I'm just saying. I'm the boss, sir. The water for being a good sport, I'm going to get checks later. That's right. I'm going to get a $50 fine in the mail. You understand? So now what this ended up being was forced assimilation, and they forced us to become more like them. Next slide. At boarding school, staff forced indigenous students to cut their hair, use new Anglo-Saxon American names, and, excuse me, they forbid children from speaking their native language and observing their religious and cultural practices. This is the same thing that they did to Judah. This is the same thing that they did to Christianity. They forced us to become Christians. They forced us to become just like them and assimilate, you understand? And this is, this is what's crazy. And by removing them from their homes, the schools disrupted students' relationships with their families and other members of the tribe. Because once they came back home, they could no longer relate or identify with their people. And you know what? And that's the same danger that we have when we think that our children's going to get a better education in a private school system. That's right. We send them there or to a Catholic school. They make a shave our beard. And then what ends up happening? We end up hating. Yeah, listen, that's trying to seek white love will make you hate black. You understand? So what will end up happening is that you get people who turn around and say, why do you talk white? You get people who turn around and they say, oh, you don't sound like us. And as a result, that's another way that they divide and conquer us. That's another way that we don't have unity amongst ourselves anymore. Next slide, please. Some students never made it home at all. You understand? Just like the, the what was it, 4,000, I think, ice, uh, uh, kids that they misplaced. How many kids that, that are they are missing right now? Hispanic children that ICE took, that they have no idea where they are. Well, that's the same thing they do to us in foster care. That's the same thing that they did to us here. Boarding schools were susceptible to deadly infections like tuberculosis and flu. And schools like Carzile had cemeteries for dead students. So they were finding mass graves of these children or reporting them as runaways. 
when I'll tell you what was really happening, some of these kids was rebellious. Some of these kids had a spine. And some of these kids fought back and they murdered these kids like they murdered Tamir Rice. You understand? I'm gonna try to chill with the understands that, but that's that that was a heavy point, Cap. I'm, I'm trying here. Next slide, please. Boarding schools based off the Carzile model fizzled out in the earlier 20th centuries, but after that, the rupture of Native American families continued in other ways. Native kids are simply being deemed to be an unfit household with unfit mothers. Isn't that the same thing they try to say about us today? Same thing they try to say about us with child services. Don't tell me we're not the same people. We all suffer under these curses. Next slide. So now, now, now we're getting into it. This is the split in the kingdom of Israel. So now we understand that we all suffer through the same things. Well, if that's the case and they took our identity, then who the hell are we? You understand? Well, we are the children of Israel. Well, how did we get separated? How did we get over to America? Well, it started with the split in Israel. It started because Solomon decided to deal with women from other nations. And as a result, remember what the scripture says. The scripture says if you deal with a woman from another nation, your heart shall, not it might, but it shall turn from the most high. And as a result, he was not perfect with the Lord like his father David was. Do you understand? And that's what it says right here, as the heart of his father David was. For after Solomon, so Solomon started to worship after their gods. Do you understand? that he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Next slave. I too be next slave. My God. Next slide. They didn't program The kingdom ain't here yet. Yeah. It's a locker. Oh, all right. So now, so now what happens is, is that he eventually gives the kingdom to Jeroboam, you understand, and takes 10 pieces, he says, for the for the northern kingdom, meaning what? Jeroboam, Ephraim, became the king in the north, the head of the northern kingdom, and took 10 tribes with him, you understand? But he shall have one tribe for my servant David's sake and for Jerusalem's sake, meaning what? He was a Judite, so Benjamin stayed with him. Now... The whole thing is that, well, what about Levi? Levi wasn't considered a tribe. Now, I'm not saying Levi is not considered Israel. Don't confuse it. You need land. You need to have inheritance is land. Levi didn't have land. Levi's inheritance was the sacrifices of the Most High. So as a result, Levi would be in the, tri in the tribe of Ephraim, in their land, in Simeon's land, in Issachar's land, in Judah's land. And they would be performing the sacrifices. They would be performing the office of priesthood. So as a result... There was still considered 12 tribes, though there was really 13 because of the tribe of Dan. Now, the thing is with Dan is that Dan didn't go and conquer land to get an inheritance. You read about that in the book of Judges. Instead, Dan ended up moving in with Manasseh. And when we went into the Assyrian captivity, Dan never came out. So therefore, Levi ended up taking the place of Dan so that there's still 12 tribes. Next slide, please. And the priest, so now, this is 2 Corinthians, I'm excuse me, 2 Corinthians, 2 Chronicles, the 11th chapter and the 13th verse. The priest and the Levites that were in all Israel resorted to him out of all their coast. For the Levites left their suburbs and possessions and came to Judah and Jerusalem. For Jeroboam and his sons had cast them off from executing the priest's office, meaning what? The Levites were kicked out of the northern kingdom. The kingdom split. The northern kingdom was given to Ephraim. Southern kingdom was given to Judah. And then we were so wicked in the northern kingdom that we didn't want the priest there. So we sent the priest. That's why when you come around to the time of Christ, who was the main three people there? Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. Because Levi came down south. Next slide. So what you start to find out as well is they try to say, oh, well, Simeon was there too. Now, mind you, let me explain something as well. That doesn't mean that there was no Judites that left with us. That doesn't mean that there was no northern kingdom that was still in Jerusalem. We're talking about the bulk of the populations. Just like if you go to Miami, you got little Haiti, you got little Havana, you got little Jamaica. That doesn't mean that there's not other tribes there. It's just talking about the bulk of the people who live there. When you read in the scriptures, you find out about Anna the prophetess in the New Testament who was an Asherite. Well, we're talking about the bulk of the populations. The problem is people are too literal. They try reading this book through the eyes of the devil, man. And as a result, they don't understand it. So now what you also start to find out is that the Lord destroyed us. You understand? There was a long season that Israel had been without a true God and without a teaching priest and without law. 
And during this time period, let me get the next slide. During this time period, what ended up happening is that, and he gathered Judah and Benjamin and the strangers with them out of Ephraim and Manasseh and out of Simeon, for they fell to him out of Israel in abundance. So now meaning when you start reading these scriptures in Second Chronicles, you find out that Simeon, although he was in the south, once all this started going on, and then we ended up leaving the Lord, Simeon came up north with us. And the borders of Israel ended up completely changing. Next slide. So now, now it gets into the exact split. So what you start to see is that the northern kingdom, you understand, was not only Israel, but the land was starting to be called Samaria. And what happened is, is that we ended up doing evil in the sight of the Lord. So now what happens is Shalomaneser comes and he ends up having us pay tribute. And now while paying tribute, this is also why the scripture says that Ephraim is a silly dove. Because what you'll find out is that he ends up, and the king of Assyria found conspiracy in Hosea, for he had sent messengers to the king of Egypt. We, instead of turning to the Lord like we did in ancient Egypt, we said, all right, these Assyrians, they starting to get serious with us. They want too much. Let's go try to make allies with Egypt. So we became a silly dove because, you understand, we were a lovebird. We wanted this oppressor, and we wanted to trade for this one. Same thing we do with the Democrats or the Republicans. Right, right, you right. understand? So now, then the king of Assyria came throughout all the lands and went up to Samaria and besieged it three years. And this started what was the initiating move of the captivity of us going into Assyria. Next slide. So now, in the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away into Assyria and placed them into Halah and the harbor. And the river goes on. You go look where these cities were. You'll find out that there was Israel in these borders. You understand? So now, for it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord. So we sinned against the Lord, and then the Lord ended up removing us. So it says, and we walk not in the statutes, excuse me, and we walk in the statutes of the heathen, whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel, and of the kings of Israel, which they made. Next slide. Therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. So what he ended up doing is because we broke the law, statutes, and commandments, he ended up rejecting us, and he cast us out, and the northern kingdom was now moved into Assyria. Next slide. So initially, this is what the kingdom of Israel looked like. We were unified, but we were all given a certain land for inheritance. Ephraim, Manasseh, Issachar, Reuben, Gad, Manasseh, all on this side. And here's another thing, too. The reason why Reuben and Gad never crossed the Jordan is because they like to follow cattle and they like to raise cattle and use that to live. That's just like the Gadites following the buffalo. They stayed on this side because it was a lot of plains. It was like the plains Indians inside of America. You're going to find out all throughout this that these spiritual attributes fit. You understand the North American Indians, so on and so forth. Next slide. So after the kingdom split, it started to look like this. Judah in the south, Israel in the north. We messed up with Assyria. Really, we messed up with the Lord. So the Lord sent Assyria to mess us up. You understand? And then we were taken away into Assyrian captivity. Next slide. Is there any proof? You damn right there is. This is the black obelisk of Shalomaneser in the British Museum. This is the tribute of Jehu. That is the tribute of Jehu, the house of Omri. The Assyrians kept records of what they did, who they put in captivity, who they destroyed. And that's why they found this artifact that lines up directly with what the scriptures said. Next slide. So now, accompanied by four attendants, King Salomonessa stands beneath the parasol with Jehu bowing down. It's how disgraceful it is, man. Our king had to bow down to a damn heathen, man. You understand? And this was carved in there. And this is in the scriptures. Next slide. So now, five Israel, now before anybody says something, I couldn't fit the five on the damn screen. I know there's only four up there, all right? But if you go and look at the whole old list, you're going to see five. So now, what you start to see is you start to see the tribute that they were paying. These are all copper tins, and it's all filled with precious metals and rubies and gold and silver. All the things that they brought because we were paying tribute. And when we stopped paying tribute, that's when they locked Hosea up, besieged the northern kingdom. And then took us on over into captivity. And this right here is them taking us into captivity. Next slide. So now, 
This is one of my favorite scriptures. Second Ezra is a scripture that so many fake Israelites do not understand. You understand? So these are the ten tribes which are those are the ten tribes which were carried away prisoner out of the land at the time of Hosea. Hosea is the Greek transliteration of Hosea. So Hosea the king, whom Solomon Esther, the king of Assyria, led, led away captive. He carried them over the waters because, remember, they took us into the riverlands. They took us onto the borders of their empire. If you go into history, you'll find out they put us in the military and we would defend them from foreign invaders. But they took his counsel amongst themselves that they would leave the multitude of the heathen and go forth, forth into a further country where never mankind dwelt. Well, where was the place that never mankind dwelt? Name somebody who was here inside the Americas besides the North American Indians. Nobody. You can't tell me they went into Africa. Africa was already inhabited by Ham. Y'all want to talk about how much y'all love Kemet so much. I act like Kemet was the first damn civilization. Africa was inhabited from north to south. You understand? So now that they might keep their statues, which they never kept in their own land. This is why you find fringes with a border of blue on all the garments of the North American Indians. This is why the oldest Ten Commandments is found where? Anybody know? Not you, Ken. <laughs> What's up? New Mexico. Get a brother hand. You know what I'm saying? They were found in New Mexico, the Los Lunes Stone. And that's not the only place that they were found because we came here with the intent of serving our power. And they entered into the Euphrates at the narrow at the narrow passage of the river. The narrowest part, come, come. The, nar the narrowest part of that river is what? Is at the very mouth of it, where it opens up into the Persian Gulf. And then we came over here into the Americas. So now, it says, for the Most High showed them signs and held still the flood till they were passed over. For through that country, there was a great way to go, namely a year and a half, and the same region called Arsareth. So now, is Arsareth Turkey? Hell no. You understand? Arsareth is, we, we're going to find out. Next slide. I'm going to show you right now. I'm going to give you a source. Everybody knows, should know this book. If not, this is Lost Tribes and Promised Land by Ronald Sanders. Ronald, what is it? Sanders. Some, some fake Jew. You understand? And he goes and does this history. And in this history, you start to uncover who the true Jews are, who the true Israelites are. Next slide. So now, a striking element in Columbus' geographical religiosity is his intense abiding and interest in the fourth or second book of Ezra. What you're going to find out, you understand, now, I might get into this another time. I don't have too much time. I'm trying to move through this, right? But Columbus was not from Italy. Columbus was from Spain. His last name was Cologne. So now, while they were in Spain, during the time of the Inquisition, Sephardic Jews were getting cast out of Spain. So as a result, you had things called conversos or new Christians. So during this time frame, they were trying to find a safe haven to practice their so-called religion, meaning their identity that they stole from us. And he converted to Christianity. And on this journey, you could read a couple of books, uh, Hope Sales, The Secret Voyage of Christopher Columbus. I'm going to try to list some of them later. Even inside this book, it breaks down that Columbus was actually Jewish. And that he was trying to do two things, find the other tribes because he believed that because the prophecies, they would have all the riches. And then also so that he would find a safe haven so that this way those Jewish people would stop being uh, uh, persecuted from Spain and Portugal during the Inquisition. So he became obsessed with where the lost tribes went. Next slide. Contrary to legend, Columbus did not sail to prove that the earth was round. Most educated Europeans and mariners already knew that. Columbus estimated that the size of the Atlantic, he estimated the size of the Atlantic Ocean from reading his Bible. He had read in the second book of Ezra in the Apocrypha that God created the world in seven parts water and six of them dry land. So meaning what? There was five continents that they knew about. They knew they were missing a continent because they read the Bible. Next slide. Well, somebody might say, how many continents are there? If you went to school in the United States where they do not educate us at all, you were taught that there were seven continents, Africa, Antarctica, Asia, Australia, Europe, North America, and South America. But using the criteria defined above, meaning in the article that I pulled this out, many geologists, meaning geologists from other parts of the world, say that there are six continents, just like the Bible said. 
So Columbus was reading this and he's like, there's another landmass that nobody dwelt at except for who? Those that were in Ezra's. You understand? The 10 tribes which came over to Arsareth, which what is Arsareth? Next slide. So now it's breaking down that he was also studying this chapter and he talks about how he held the waters for them and they traveled another year and a half to a region called Arsareth. Evidently a Greek corruption of the Hebrew, which what they want to say, Cap's going to laugh, but Aretz, which is Aratiza. Right. You understand? Aratiza meaning earth land or another country it's the greek transliteration just like earlier when you saw ose which is really hosea arsareth was america man next slide so now out of all the interpreters that columbus could have brought with him what do you think the language was let me hear it hebrew, hebrew. There was only one interpreter that he brought with him, Luis de Torres, a so-called Jew who had occupied a position under the government. He was fluent in Hebrew because Columbus knew who the hell he was going to see. He knew who he was going to find. Right. Next slide. So now, I don't know, Katazan. What about the Bering Strait? The Bar if I may, nobody said no. The Bering Strait is bullshit. That's right. You understand? That is a goddamn lie from the devil in the earth. So now the Bering Strait myth is not so much science as it is politics. Much objective modern science in the past several decades has even suggested that it is highly questionable if there ever was a so-called land bridge or ice bridge as some have defined it. Yes, that's right. From an in-depth, intensive, non-politically affected and unbiased scientific study of the earth's history, countless scientists Mostly non-American. You starting to see a pattern here? Mostly non-American have concluded that there most likely never was a land bridge. Most U.S. history books and many other books written about the North American indigenous people began by propagating the Bering Strait myth, telling the silly story of thousands, even millions of early First Nation people migrating from Asia across the so-called land bridge, the Bering Strait. Next slide. We're going to destroy this today. Also known as the Bering Strait, the theory of Beringer theory, the land bridge theory, has been widely accepted since the 1930s. The idea was first postulated in a rudimentary fashion, meaning what? No science at all. This was a theory, a thought, which was by who? A Jesuit. You know anything about the Jesuits? Their whole job is to distort the truth. You understand? Like, like Commander General Johannes said it best. If... The Catholic Church is the American government and the Jesuits are their CIA. They infiltrate organizations in order to make them what? Start teaching immaculate conception. Start getting closer to the Catholic doctrine. Because they realize it don't matter if you're directly aligned with us as long as you're teaching what we teach. So Jose de Acosta was one of these people who came over in 1590 and he created this theory. And as a result, everybody started to run with it. Next slide. This book right here used to be $30. It's $800 now, ever since we did breakdowns on it. That's why if y'all want to know why I'm not putting the book listing out yet or the complete book listing, it's because I want y'all to be able to get these books before they raise the prices. So after this lecture, I'm going to be sending out the book list. Get what you can because I guarantee you they're all going to be skyrocketing on Amazon. So now this is unexpected faces inside of ancient America. And what you're going to find out is that he did a history and said that without a doubt, we had to have come across the Atlantic. There's no way that we didn't sail. There's no way that we came from Siberia. Next slide. Looking carefully at all the faces on the poster, one begins to wonder if the ancestors who produced this extreme variety of racial types could really have been channeled exclusively through the gateways of Siberia and Alaska. The new world, there came a moment where I felt almost like a child who finds out that Santa Claus is not real and that the simplistic explanation of the Bering Strait alone would not be the ultimate solution of the complicated problem of America's ancient population in history. I am not the only one who, to have suspicions about the Bering Strait theory. Charles Bennett, anybody saying something? What's up? Y'all good? No sweat. So now, he wrote a book called The Mysteries from the Forgotten World and gives a summary on what's now being discussed and investigated 
and disputed amongst the ancient American history. In chapter 8, he says, most anthropologists accept the theory that the ancestors of the American Indians once walked from Siberia over the frozen Bering Strait and eventually pop populated the Americas from Alaska to the southern tip of Tierra del Fuego with the wild tribes and civilized empires and nations found in America and the first European explorers. Everyone seems to believe this except the Indians themselves. Past and present who have conserved oral, written, and, pict and pictorial traditions of their province, practically none of which have to do with Siberia, meaning none of them do. To this statement, one should add the prudent myths of pre-Columbian America by Donald A. McKenzie, written about 50 years ago, and now difficult to find, just like all the books, just like they removed the pages of 13 Tribes. They keep removing this information so we get stuck with their propaganda and their theories. So now, longer the story short, when they turn around and say a lot about the oral traditions and pictorial traditions of the Native Americans, both authors seem to believe that the Indians are not as quite ignorant concerning their history as some people seem to presume, and that the modern white man is not necessarily always right about the ancient past of America. Because once again, you're smarter than the white man. The white man is the devil that the Bible speaks of. Right, right, right. And they covered up this history. Next slide. So now, the professionals tend to be indoctrinated along the lines of accepted opinion, and they better had be if they desire smooth careers. I remember meeting the czar of Amer Indian ethnology at the Smithsonian. I want y'all to embed this word into your brain right now, the Bureau of Ethnology, because I'm going to read this at this later. So now, in this Bureau of Ethnology, you understand, Alex Hildreka, when I was very young in those days, anyone who challenged his thesis at all, that the Indians had come across the Bering Strait, would find it difficult to get a job anywhere in that field. Hildreka is dead, but his intellectual tyranny has not yet expired. This was not based on science when they discovered it. It was a goddamn lie made by a Jesuit because of manifest destiny. If they were to turn around and prove that the North American Indians came from a, a, a civilization such as, oh, say, the Jews, someone you have to respect, they wouldn't have been able to take the land. Right. So what they did was... They made sure that they indoctrinated anybody to keep pushing this theory. And you're going to find out later why, to this day, they will not admit that we are the 12 tribes of Israel. But they made it, they made it an indoctrinated event so that you cannot teach this inside anywhere. So that's why people say, oh, well, I can't find the source. You can't find the source because they won't let you find the source. Right. Next slide. Native Americans have denied the Bering Strait theory, which is what we went over. The politicians also stated that it was America's manifest destiny to expand westward across the North American continent, bringing democratic ideals to less enlightened peoples. Once again, it was propaganda because remember what I said earlier, they thought we were savages. They wanted, they turned around and it was all their prejudice that they wrote about. Next slide. Need you to stay locked in. I know you're trying to focus on the information. Stay with me, brother. Doing a good job, though. So now we're about to get. This is one of the authors. You understand? This is James Adair. James Adair lived amongst the North American Indians, and he's arguably the most significant 18th century worker on the southeastern Indians. The history of the American Indians, published in London in 1775. So now he starts talking about his first-hand observations derived from his 40 years career as a deerskin trader amongst the North American Indians. So now what he turned around and said is that the Indians are of Hebrew descent, the lost tribes of Israel. And the reason why he did this is because he started studying how they lived. He wasn't trying to enslave them. He was just trying to get to know them. And upon getting to know them, he said, yo, they're following Levitical law. Next slide. Some have supposed for the Americans to be descended from the Chinese. They try saying we're mongoloids. And even if you try saying we're a mongoloid, you're whitewashed. That comes from Johann Blumenbacher. He said that everybody comes from three different races, Mongoloid, Negroid, and Caucasoid. The Bible said we come from Shem, Ham, and Japheth. What are you smoking? You understand? There's something wrong with you. So now, neither their religion, laws, or customs agree in the least with those that, of the Chinese, which sufficiently prove they are not of that line. So now he starts going into how 
all these different ships that the Chinese had. They couldn't even sail over here. Next slide. So now what he starts breaking down is that their ceremonies, their custom, we couldn't have come from Scythia. We couldn't have come from Siberia. None of our customs match with any of them. Next slide. But there's something very interesting that he puts two and two together. So he starts saying that when you start to look at all the different settlements from Peru and Mexico, several of the Indian nations assure us they crossed the Mississippi before they made their present northern settlements, which connected with the former arguments will sufficiently explode that weak opinion that the Aborigines are descended from the Tartars or ancient Scythians, meaning what? Go take a look at all the pyramids. All the major, you understand, look at the Aztecs, look at the Incas, look at the Mayas. Where's all their civilizations located? South America. So why is it that they would start in Alaska, decide to say F the rest of the land, move all the way down to South America, and then start building pyramids in their civilization? No. Their migration started south. They moved north. And then crossed the Mississippi. So meaning what? They came from the southeast. They didn't come from the northwest. So what does that mean? You can get that bearing straight theory out of here. You understand? Right. We crossed the Atlantic because we are the lost tribes that it was talking about in Ezra. Next slide. So now, but history and the origin of tribes. This is in James Adair's book on page 72. It says, but history and the origin of tribes and nations have hitherto been covered with a great deal of obscurity. Some ancient historians were ignorant, others prejudiced. Some searchers into antiquities adopted the traditional tales of their predecessors, and others looking with contempt on the origin of the tribes and societies altogether exploded them without investigation. So when you start hearing that we were cannibals, when you start hearing that we were savages, it was the propaganda that they put based on the prejudice of the people who came here and didn't give a damn about really studying us. So you got to be careful because anyone in history has an agenda. You have somebody who has an agenda who says what? The transatlantic slave trade happened. Then you have America's agenda, which is what? Trying to cover up their ugly history, saying it was the transatlantic migration. Well, that's the same thing with the North American Indians. Next slide. Yeah, now we in it. Now we at the chart. You understand? That was just the introduction. The lecture has officially started, all right? Give it up. So now, when you go to Genesis 49, if you want to, like, for example, everybody knows that America's Babylon. Christians won't argue that. When I say Christians, I mean fake Israelites too. How do we know that America is Babylon? Because of the spiritual attributes, because of the blueprint that was left inside the scriptures, which identifies it as America because they correlate and line up. Well, this is our treasure map. This was our identifying markers for know who the hell and what the hell we would be doing in the last days. This is Genesis 49 and 1. And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that they may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. We're in the last days right now. Nobody will argue that either. So these prophecies have to be concerning today. Gather yourselves together and hear ye sons of Jacob and hearken unto, hearken unto Israel your father. Next slide. So now. I'm going with Ephraim, Manessa, and Simeon. When we talk about Joseph, we're talking about Ephraim and Manessa. So we're talking about Puerto Rico, we're talking about Cuba, and we're also talking about Hispaniola. Now, I'm not going to get into Simeon just yet. I'm going to break him down later. You understand? But the archaeology that I'm about to bring out has to do with the Caribbean. So that's why I'm linking these three together, all right? So now, Joseph is a bow, even a fruitful bow by a well, meaning what? That he's a tree. He's fruitful. And now he's by a well, meaning what? Water, just like Ephraim was by the islands. You understand? He's letting you know that these, these Indians, these people, out the tribe of Ephraim was going to be by a water supply. You understand? So now whose branches run over the wall, meaning what? It's just like the scripture says that Ephraim is a cake not turned. You understand? Ephraim started to mix himself with all these other people, all these other nations. And that's a history that we've had inside these different captivities. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. That's the so-called white man conquering Puerto Rico, conquering the Bahamas, conquering Hispaniola. And 
I, I didn't have enough time. I had so much things that I wanted to put in here, but one of them was some of the ships and navigators, if they wanted to know how to get to the next island, all they had to do was follow a trail of floating bodies. That's how many of them they were killing. So now, but his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty power of Jacob. So now you start to see that, you understand, like Ephraim is somebody who's noted for being strong and, and, and strengthened, even by God the Father, who shall help thee, by the Almighty, who shall bless thee with the blessings of heaven above, and blessings of the deep and under that lie, the blessing of the breast and of the womb. Meaning, like, let me tell you something, man. Like, my father got five kids. He told me some of them got pregnant through birth control. You understand? Like, I'm telling you, like, he, he, like, like eat from might or something like that. We hunger, sister. She might get pregnant. Straight up and down. I'm telling you. Sneeze too close to you. You know what I'm saying? I'm on child support. Great. So now, the blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of thy progenitors, meaning that this is a tribe, which is why they ended up becoming, you understand, the head of the northern kingdom, because of the inheritance, because of the blessings that they had. Next slide. So now, the next publication which we will discuss will be a piece of 19th century literature by some German, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Case Serling, whatever. So his work primarily deals with the contributions of the Jews to the voyages of Christopher Columbus. So it starts talking about the Caribbean. And what he finds out is that the Indians of the Americas are the lost tribes of Israel. And the main focus is on the Tainos and the Arawaks. So now, once again, we're talking about Hispaniola, the Simeonites. And we're talking about the Tainos, the Caribs, the rest of the Arawaks, meaning what? We're talking about Ephraim and Manesson, Cuba and Puerto Rico. Next slide. This is the book, if any of you want to know. This is what he wrote. Christopher Columbus and the participation of the Jews in the Spanish and Portuguese discoveries. Next slide. This is a letter that was, tr this, is, this is a translation of a primary source. There was a conquistador, a Portuguese cat, that he turned around and he started studying the North American Indians. He started studying the Indians of the Caribbeans, and this is what he found. The language of the Indians in Hispaniola, Cuba, Jamaica, and the adjoining islands, he contends that it has many resemblances to Hebrew. So he starts breaking down all the different words that all line up with Hebrew. So their rites and ceremonies, as well as their language, form one of the main arguments in favor of this theory of descent. Circumcision prevailed among the Indians. They often bathed in rivers because we invented cleanliness. You understand? Like, next slide. And streams, they refrained from touching the dead because you would have to be quarantined then. You came around the dead, you were unclean for seven days. And from tasting blood. They had definite fast days, meaning what? The Day of Atonement. Marriage with sister-in-laws was permitted if they were childless widows. Right there, that's the, the law of the kinsmen. Wives were discarded for new helpmates because, once again, the law of Moses said that you were able to divorce. They also sacrificed first fruits on high mountains and under shady trees. They had temples and carried a holy ark before them in a time of war. They were also like the ten tribes inclined to idol worship. Because once again, that's why the white man came over and destroyed us. But we still had traces of our culture. Next slide. This right here, los indios de las indias, islas son hebreos. The Indians of the islands are Hebrews. What we just read was the translated version of this letter. Next slide. A Portuguese Marino Villafor, who strange to say had called himself Montezinos and afterwards assumed the name Aaron Levi, informed Vanessa that he had mingled in South America with Jews of the Ten Tribes. Why is this so important? Remember this later. Remember he was in South America. Next slide. This is from Lost Tribes and Promised Land. The woman got off and spoke to Francisco in an Indian tongue. So this is Montezinos with this cat, uh, uh, Francisco, and they were in Quito, Peru. While they were in Quito, Peru, this is what happened. It says that he, they spoke in a language he could not understand. Blase, blase. Upon hearing the words, they rose. They went over to Montezinos and heard his utter astonishment. Shema Yasha'ala Yahawah Lahayanawa Yahawah Akad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. They had recited in Hebrew the fundamental credo of Judaism. A brief conversation then ensued in their common ancestral tongue, according to Montezinos, whose fluency in it is almost as perplexing to the reader of his narrative as that of his three mysteries to, to his companions. 
they told him that they themselves were of the tribe of Reuben and that the tribe of Joseph lived on islands nearby. So now who is this tribe of Joseph that lived on islands nearby? This was Ephraim and Manasseh inside the same islands where they were sacrificing, uh, sacrificing first fruits on the mountains, circumcising their young, keeping the laws, statutes, and commandments that they knew about still at this time. Next slide. Oh, yeah, now it gets deep. He's talking about these stones, these rocks. He's talking about the characters. Hebreo. These characters are Hebrew. And it says that they have the ten tribes of Israel. Take a look at all those stones. Was it? These stones are known as the stones of Father Nazario. They were passed down by one of the chiefs all throughout his generations. And the, the, the chief's daughter went and passed these over, you understand, to this cat called Father Nazario. For years, they knew about these stones. Then somebody turned around and said, yo, these stones have Hebrew on them. And they started to translate the stones. Not only did it say that they crossed the Atlantic, but it had the names of the 10 tribes of Israel who left the captivity of Assyria. This was found inside Puerto Rico. There was hundreds of these stones. And what happened is, is that they, tried, they had to fight with the government even to keep them. The majority of these interviews were in Spanish, except for maybe one or two. Give me the next slide. I want y'all to see this video right here. A friend of mine, he is a director, a curator in a museum in France, you know, because Alphonse Pinard took some pieces to different museums. And I said, man, you know, are these pieces there? He says, man, yeah, they're here, right? And the, in France, I found, uh, he found like 38 artifacts that the father had given to the priest. So, he, he, but he writes to me, hey, but the stones say, Hanoa, Puerto Rico. Mm. Hanoa, Puerto Rico. You know, Hanoa, what's Hanoa? You know, like I've been you know, researching Hanoa. And I've been you know, looking at you know, historical documents, everything, right? And so I've been you know, saying, well, Hanoa, put it on the internet, you know. So Hanoa. Pause this real quick. It's a, it's a territory. On? You know, where the. On, listen, on these stones, right? There were certain stones that were sent to France. They start studying them. They find Hanoa, Puerto Rico. So he starts looking through every ancient manifest he can find to try to find Hanoa in Puerto Rico. Can't find it. So now, where do you think the only place Hanoa existed in the world? Good play. Uh, tribe of Ephraim was uh, located. And so the, the give me the next slide. Uh, uh, Hanoa, a place named on the eastern boundary of Ephraim, meaning that this was in the land of the northern kingdom. So the sons of Joseph were on islands nearby South America, the Caribbean, where they found Hebrew stones with Hanoa carved into them. Don't tell me the 12 tribe chart ain't accurate. This is the goddamn tribe of Ephraim. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. But now, this came out in 2017. Ariane knew this in the 70s. You understand? In the late 60s. Since 1969, we knew this. And y'all want to talk about, oh, it was a vision. Man, fuck you. Excuse me. You understand? Salakia. Salakia. So I'm sorry. I, I apologize. But the point being is that y'all cannot come against this, man. You understand, like, this ISUPK is the home of the truth. Next slide. So now, this is the Aborigines of Puerto Rico and the neighboring islands. Now, mind you, in the very beginning of this book, it says that whatever is true for this is also true for Hispaniola. So now, once again, all this has to do with Simeon as well. Whatever you start to prove for the Puerto Ricans is what you can prove for the Cubans, is what you can also prove for Hispaniola. Next slide. So now, what you start to find out is that 
Uh, I'm going to just fast forward straight to the point. This is basically about how we had multiple wives. I mean, you want me to skip over that? I don't think you do. Wow. <laughs> Thought so. So comparatively, little is known about the marriage cust uh, excuse me about the marriage customs of the native excuse me of the native Aboriginal of Puerto Rico, and it is commonly stated that wives were treated as slaves. Now, why did I say this? Because that's exactly what they try to say about us today. Because as soon as the white man sees that a woman is cooking and cleaning, you understand, for her husband, she's a slave now. You understand, a white man is the devil trying to break up all families. You understand? There is every reason to believe that the caciques were polygamous, meaning that they had more than one wife. That's a part of our culture. That is, that is so wild. <laughs> the great men recorded, okay, uh, so he starts talking more about that. So now, Lacasas mentions that the betrothals of the caciques would, excuse me, would be husband, would send his principal man to the maid's father, meaning that he would send his servant to the woman's father. So now, what you start to find out is that they would turn around and they would pay dowries for the bride. So they would turn around and he'd be like, yo, this is, this is your daughter. I want to marry her. And then he would turn around and give them something for him. And then they drop down. And it says that this is directly connected as becoming of the servants of her father as Jacob served Laban for Rachel and Leah. They start, you can go and you can find every single one of our customs, culture, all throughout all of the culture of the North American Indians. Next slide. So now traces of Phoenician, when you see Phoenician, this is talking about ancient Hebrew. Uh, traces of Phoenician involvement in the Caribbean go beyond Cuba, meaning they found Hebrew in Cuba, appearing in the strange bearded petroglyphs of the islands of Hispaniola in Puerto Rico. Next slide. So what you start to find out is also the strange headpieces that they found, meaning that they called this a turban. So what the hell was a metri or a turban doing carved into a rock inside of Puerto Rico? Next slide. Also, the same way that they had these, they try to say, oh, Indians can't grow beards, this and that. We started carving what the hell we can do or what we couldn't do inside these walls. This is important. We're going to save this for later. Next slide. Next slide. Zebulon, Guatemala to Panama. Zebulon shall dwell at the haven of the sea and shall be as a haven of ships and his borders shall be on to Zidane because Zidane was a great ship haven. It was comparing Zidane to what? To the Panama Canal. Remember, this is where we would be in the last days. When you go and take a look at Guatemala to Panama, this is a major shipping route, giving you the identification of who these people are. Next slide. So now, on a journey of investigation to Central America, I had an interesting experience in Honduras, the country which was, excuse me, the country which the incredible archaeological monuments of Copan are located at. So now this is all of pre-Columbian humanity. I would discover the works of Greek scholar George, I cannot pronounce that, Moldavia, and it says a member of his various science, scientific societies on the island. So now he starts going in and talking about the book that he wrote from Honduras, and he wrote a book in 1962 after he left Honduras in Nicaragua. Under the auspicious of First International Conference, Caribbean archaeologists called Los, Israelit, uh, Los Israelitas and America de Pre-Columbia, meaning what? Israelites in Pre-Columbian America. He started to go and he started to study the linguistics and the linguistics, meaning the language of the Indians in Nicaragua, in Honduras, which all of this is in the territory that we say Zebulon is in. And it says that it was Hebrew. This is the language that they were speaking just like they were speaking inside the Caribbean. Next slide. Oviedo says that the Indians of Nicaragua refrained from all work on, on the days dedicated to religious festivals, meaning what? When we would have the Passover, when we would have those days of atonement, those were high holy days. And it says, and the same custom existed among the Peruvians. Why am I mentioning the Peruvians? Because once again, if you prove it for Puerto Rico, you prove it for Hispaniola. Well, if you prove it for Nicaragua, you prove it for South America. You prove it for South America, you prove it for Central America. You're going to find out that all these different tribes all had the same customs. 
that it was very probable that the Sabbath day of the seventh day was known in some parts of America. I mean, what? Every seven days, the Indians would rest from work. Original Indian traditions recorded in the providence of Guatemala. Well, remember, Guatemala and Panama, we're talking about Zebulon, was in early stages uh, colonized by the Jews who assumed these names. So they're saying that these original people in antiquity, pre-Columbian, and this is in the antiquities of Mexico, 1830, these were Jews. Next slide. So now, and here's something else, man. You understand? And this, 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 this is what kills me. They always try talking about, where's Brazil on your chart? Well, it's right in between Colombia to Uruguay. All you needed was a map to see Venezuela, Peru, Bolivia, Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay. This is where the tribes is at. You understand? But right now we're talking about Neftili. You understand? So we're talking about Chile to Argentina. So now Neftili is a hind let loose. He giveth goodly words. Y'all ever see a deer just run free? You understand how wild they are? That's like them running up and down that soccer field. Well, let me talk to you about some good words as well. Next slide. How many of you are familiar with Galvarano? Nobody? Galvarano was a Mapuche from Chile, right? And what happened is, is that, you see this? He went and bucked up against the Spaniards. So they turned around and they chopped off one of his arms. He said, yeah, take my other one too. Yo, we so stubborn, ain't we? It's crazy. Next slide. Well, he had some goodly words, and he went back and he waged a war council. And in that war council, yo, Akia, you see this? Even though he had nubs, you understand? This is a hind let loose. He strapped blades to his arms and went and fought the Spanish. Gangster. Next slide. So now, well, is there anything else for Chile? Find out. The Reverend W.M. Smith, a Presbyterian minister among the Indians who had finished translating the New Testament in the Mohegan language. Mind you, Mohegan language, the Mohegans are the Creeks. The Creeks are the Seminoles. So once again, what was Reuben speaking inside of South America? He's speaking Hebrew. So now when they migrated up north, they were still speaking Hebrew. So when they started studying the Mohegan language, he told the writer for years and labored to make the paradigm of the Mohegan verb. At length, it struck me that it was cast in the Hebrew mold. And I made this one, which I will show you. It was printed on a large sheet. Any Hebrew scholar would once recognize the suffixes and affixes of the Hebrew Bible. At the time the writer heard this, Mr. Smith was in Albany superintending the publication of the Mohegan Testament. Several years before that, the writer had seen a, a, the grammar of the Chilean language and the verb was cast in that hebrew mold so now we start to see that we find the hebrew artifacts in the caribbean we're starting to see that from guatemala to panama they're speaking hebrew keeping the sabbath and then when we come back down to south america and argentina and chile they're speaking hebrew as well don't tell me man don't tell me a goddamn thing so now it says very true but let it be remembered on our side that Hebrew emigrants had been in America 500 years before Christ. And of course, the Mexicans are descendants of the Hebrews. If that be true, then the Chileans are. Because every time they compare the Chilean culture to Mexican culture, it was identical. You understand? So now it also starts to say, and this is another thing for anybody who tries to talk about the Lashwan Kodash. When they started to talk about the language in Mexico, they told the writer that the language of the Mexicans was a very jingling language, a great many consonants and few vowels. I should just drop this mic and walk out right now. Give me the next slide. Asher, Colombia to Uruguay. So now, once again, Colombia, Brazil, Peru, Bolivia, Paraguay, Uruguay, Venezuela, so on and so forth. It says, out of Asher, his bread shall be fat, and he shall yield royal dainties. When you go and you look at where all the cocoa is coming from, all the resources, all these different fruits, all of it comes from these lands. You understand? Like, they have an incredibly, you understand, rich, uh, uh, fertile soil and all that. And this is supposed to be what? The lands we would be in in the last days. Next slide. Now, here's something else that I want you to do. Don't get caught up 
in so much of these borders that you see today. Because realistically, all of this belonged to Asher. All of this belonged to Asher because this was the Incan Empire. The Incan Empire was the capital was in Peru. And then it stretched all the way on down into the tips of Chile and into Bolivia. And then these people migrated and went over into all these different lands. Next slide. So now, actually, the Indians did appear to keep certain parts of laws in certain areas. The Incas. So if we're talking about the Incas right now, we're talking about the tribe of Asher. The Incas, excuse, the Incas held a festival in March similar to the Passover. The Yucatan Indians practiced circumcisions. Mexicans and Indians had eternal altar fires. If you know anything about the temple, we had fires that would never go out for our sacrifices. And they want to say we can't have a fire on the Sabbath, right? We're smoking crack. So now it says the eternal altar fires. Some Nicaraguans, so now this is why I went in this order, because you're going to start to see. They compare Mexico down with the Incas all the way on back to Central America. You understand? would not allow women who had recently given birth into the temples. Why? Because if a woman gave birth, she was unclean for 30 to 90 days, depending on the gender of the child. So other parts of the law observed at various places who says that men should not sleep with women who had recently given birth. Once again, that's another part of our customs. You can't sleep with a woman who's unclean. If a man slept with a slave, both were whipped, adulteresses were to be stoned. Oh, that is Old Testament. You understand? So now, and it says, and a widow must marry her nearest male re relative. This is the same thing that they were doing in the Caribbean. They were keeping the law of the kinsmen. Next slide. Matter of fact, go back. Salak it. Oh, good shot. How could I forget? It says the Indians did retain a few Hebrew words, such as the Yucatan, Mexico, and Peru. When you, when you go and you look, this is all bastardizations of what the Spanish would call it. It's like, for example, a paria. Paria is fruitful. Paru, paria, fruitful, fertile. These are all the things we named all these lands. Same thing with Brazil. Brazil comes from Barzal because of all the metals that they got there. Barzal is iron. That's right. Next slide. So now, I shall speak on somewhat the scores of the diverse opinions which have been taught and declared in what countries is thought the ten tribes are. Hispaniola, Dominican Republic, the island of Cuba, the continent, the continent of America, Panama, New Spain, which is Mexico, and Peru. Like how many writers do you need? How many sources? How many artifacts that they're all saying the same thing about our people? Next slide. Like the Jews, the Indians offer their first fruits. They keep their new moons and feast. Now, once again, you're starting to see a pattern here. What they do in the Caribbean, they do in South America. What they do in South America, they do in North America. If you prove it for one, you prove it for all. They did these comparative studies on the Caribbean and with South America. That's why these writers and explorers who were going all over, this is what they were finding. So now, once again, these are all the different writers of Peruvian antiquities and what they were doing. So now, in some parts of North America, circumcision is practiced. There is also much analogy between the Hebrews and the Indians, that which concerns various rites and customs, such as ceremonies of purification, the, the use of bath, fasting, and the manner of prayer. The Indians likewise abstain from the blood of animals. You starting to see that everywhere we did this? Next slide. What's that right there? It's the Star of Moloch. <laughs> Listen, man, we rocked the shield of David throughout all our generations. This is an artifact that was taken from Peru to a museum out in Seville, Spain. Matter of fact, man, Officer Zaka War sent me this information out of New York, man. You understand? We're really New Jersey, Newark, New Jersey. That's my man, Free Grand, right there. He helped me with some of this research. And he sent me this shield. This is a bowl that they made. You understand? Next slide. And another one right here. We start to find this also came out of Peru. You find the shield of David all throughout South America, North America, all over the Gadites, among the Seminole Indians. And a lot of these artifacts were destroyed. Matter of fact, there used to be, I don't know if y'all know what earth mounds are. Earth mounds or earthworks is when they make designs 
out of the ground. Well, they made these designs out of the ground. In Peru, there was a giant shield of David that you were able to see from Google Earth, and they had an image of it if you searched it. I can't find it anywhere now. They had shield of David's carved into the mountains in Nicaragua. Can't find any of it now. So, like, let me tell y'all something. If y'all find an artifact, if y'all find something online, rip it off the internet immediately. Because you don't know how much longer it's going to be there because this information doesn't stay up long. Next slide. Issachar. Now, I went a little biased with Issachar because so many people got beef with my Mexican brothers. So it's probably going to be about 15, 16 slides just on Issachar. Because I don't want to hear a goddamn thing after today. I promise you. So now, Issachar is a strong ass crouching down between two burdens. If you go and you look at a lot of uh, 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 Issachar murals or culture, you'll find an ass, which is a donkey, you understand, with a bag wrapped over it, you understand? Meaning what? Issachar is hard working, you understand? Well, I'm not here, I'm working construction, and I hate working with Issachar, because they think I'm gonna work like them. I'm like, I'm Papa, I'm Puerto Rican, we don't do this. You know what I'm saying? We, I, I, I'm not doing that. You know, he's up there with no harness, one leg like this, like hanging off the side of the building. I'm like, bro, I don't, can't pay me enough to do that. So, ain't even my land. So he like, and he saw that rest was good because what do they have down in Mexico? They got the siesta. You understand? They tried to enslave the Mexican Indians, and during a certain part of the day, they would all just stop working unanimously. And no matter how much they beat them, no matter what they did, they would not stop. That's where the siesta comes from. You understand? And that rest was good, and that the land was present. And he bowed his shoulders to bear and became a servant unto tribute. Issachar going through all those jobs that nobody else would do. Issachar made himself a servant unto tribute. Well, let's see if there's any archaeology on this. Next slide. It is not improbable that the Jews who were driven from Nineveh by Salamanessa wandered into uninhabited regions. According to Herrera, the Indians cherished that the Yuk, excuse me, the tradition that the Yucatan had been settled by tribes of the Orient, meaning what? The Far East. Next slide. Well, where the hell is the Yucatan? The Yucatan is the peninsula. It is the first spot that the Spaniards invaded inside of uh, 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 North America when Cortez came. You understand? So this is Mexico when we're talking about the Yucatan. Next slide. Now, this is Bernard de Sagun. It says, Bernard Sagun was one of the very first preachers in New Spain, which is Mexico. He was also a Franciscan Spaniard who spent 60 years among the Indians. He acquired a great proficiency in the knowledge of the Aztec language and history. Sagun, amongst his many works, most famous for his volume compilation, General History of New Spain. One of the many facts of this Franciscan that he brought out is in support of the Aztecs being one of the lost tribes of Israel. So once again, you keep going inside this culture and they're all saying the Mexicans are Israelites. Right. They are the lost tribes. Right. And this was written before they brought you to here. Right. These are all written in the 1500s, 1600s. Next slide. Some old men of the Yucatan say that they have heard from their ancestors that this country of people, excuse me, that this country was peopled by a certain race who came from the east whom God delivered by opening for them 12 roads through the sea. If this is true, all the inhabitants of the Indies must be Jewish descent. Next slide. That was written in 1566, by the way. Many customs of the Mexicans strongly savoring at Judaism. Besides that of circumcision having already been noticed, such as they are wearing fringes fastened to their garments, practicing frequent ab abulitions, attending constant public places of worship which they were summoned to by the blowing of horns as the jews are at the synagogues anointing themselves with oils addressing each other with appellation of brother and sister which is what the hell we've been doing right you understand ah, ah, wah. you understand come on man i know y'all heard that eric about do so so now you understand they turn around they say allowing their priests their hair to grow long like the nazarites though some I can't even read that word. Tonsur, they frequently doing penance, strewing dust on their heads, blackening themselves with ashes, which is exactly what we would do during a time. We would rent our garments and then throw dust on ourselves. So now you start to look all through this. All of this is taken from the antiquities of Mexico in 1830. You understand? Give me the next slide. 
once again, y'all get this at home. Pause it. Read it. I'm trying to get through this as fast as possible. We got a lot of information to go through still. Both the Mexicans and the Peruvians. So now, once again, we're talking about Issachar and we're talking about Asher were accustomed to taking off their sandals whenever they trod upon holy ground or entered the places of their kings. This is exactly what the Lord told Moses to do. You stand on holy ground, unloose your sandals. It's the same thing that the angel told Joshua, you understand, in the fifth chapter of the book of Joshua. This is exactly what we would do. It says, it is certainly very extraordinary to find Oronco. So now, once again, this is in Venezuela. So it says the voyages to the West Indies at the Indian nations so far remote from each other as those of the Aronco and the tribes who live in the confines of, of Peru and the banks of La Plata as well. So now what you're starting to see is they're going through all South America and they're going from Venezuela all the way on over to Peru, all the way on up to Mexico, all the way on down into Chile. And they said that why are they all using circumcision? And why is it that all of them abstain from eating the flesh of swine? Because this was Levitical law. This is exactly what we've been doing, man. Next slide. Whoa. Whoa. What do we got here? This is an Issachar. Right? This is like my man from Carolina. Dawa Dawa. What's his name? You know what I'm talking about, man. Lahab, brother. Tell me this don't look like Lahab, bro. <laughs> This is Lahav at the Passover, man. You understand? Uh, 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 Yahweh Allah done made this chain. Karab done made this Torah. You get what I'm saying? Like, this, this, this right here, this is the Passover. And what you see, you see fringes on everything. You understand? You see a garment, girded with a belt, war belt down to the paps. Right? right. You understand? Come on, man. I'm just being extra now. Next slide. So now, what y'all see right here? You understand? You see the Maganda with that right up in the earring. You understand? That's like Captain Todd War right there. He always rocking that. So now it says that this right here was taken out of Mexico. They said that this was a Mayan dignitary sailing on a ship. They trying to say the Indians couldn't sail. You understand? What the hell is he doing with his headpiece on? Tell me that don't look just like what was called up in Puerto Rico. You understand? You start to take a look at all these. I guarantee you this is open at the top. You understand there's a metri, right? That's right. You understand that they follow in all the customs and culture of all people. Next slide. So now they start talking about the symbolic headdresses on the uh, on this Mayan steel. It says recently was discovered that they start breaking this whole thing down, talking about how it was the star of David. You understand? And that they start saying that Israel wasn't able to sail either. Meanwhile, they got a damn maritime museum up in Israel. Solomon had a navy. How are you going to say the Israelites couldn't sail? Don't tell me we couldn't sail to America. So now right down here, it starts talking about it. It says they tried saying that it was just for decorative motifs. And now it says that's plain wrong. It says the clear design on the earring was not put there because it looked pretty. As everything else on the Mayan stela, it had a definite meaning. And what was that meaning? The fact that they were representing our nation. They were representing Israel, man, because they were speaking Hebrew. They were circumcising their young. They were they were, they, they were uh, uh, going to war with an ark. You understand? Because these are the lost tribes of Israel. Next slide. Now, this is called the phylactery stele. Steel, whatever you want to call it. Anybody know what a phylactery is? Nobody? Come on, brother. Let me hear. No, no, I can't. Uh, a phylactery is a a small box that scripture are put in, and they uh, used to wear it around the forehead or on what the shoulders. You, what do you see right there? We see a small box strapped to his forehead, right? Or you see this? This is a cord that's being wound seven times around the arm. You go and you Google the tradition of phylacteries. It's a cord wound. Seven times around your arm. When you're reading the scriptures in Matthew's the 23rd chapter, what did Yahweh Shah say about the Pharisees? They make broadened phylacteries. Phylacteries initially was something that you would strap to your arm to keep scriptures in. You'd be traveling. So what happens is, is that you strap the phylacteries to your arm. You'd have the box with the scriptures in, and then on your journey, maybe you'd stop to pray, you'd stop to study, you'd stop to read. So now, as time went on, that's cold, right? Tell me that ain't cold, Cap. So, so as time goes on, 
they started to turn that into like what Christian women do with their big hats. They brought in the phylacteries, and whoever had the biggest phylactery was the holiest. You right, understand? Right. Well, they started finding phylacteries amongst the North American Indians. And this was what was considered a ceremonial prayer before the game began. Huh. Next slide. There is another important classic stone, you understand, that originated in the display of the Museum of Mexico. The figures are wearing what they're calling false beards and are obviously engaged in ceremonial preparations before a ball game, but overlook the fact that the protagonist has a cord wound around his arm exactly seven times and then twisted around his middle finger three times. I am indebted to Mrs. Joan Gordon for pointing this out to me. Recently, I conducted, so now they turn around and say that this is a surprisingly correct display of phylacteries. They said that this is something that's still observed by Orthodox Jewish people. Because they, once again, they got all their traditions from us. Next slide. So now, once again, this is just more people who were studying it and all agreed that this was a phylactery. They all agreed that the Indians in Mexico were rocking phylacteries. Right. Next slide. Once again, this is just more sources. All of them saying that this is a phylactery box that's strapped to his forehead. Next slide. So now, diffusion in America during the 18th and early 19th century. In reflecting on all the newly found pieces of evidence, it seemed appropriate to look more seriously in the opinions of early investigations of Jewish diffusion in America. So now what you start to find out is that there was somebody called Diego Duran. So a lot of these excerpts I'm getting from either their original works or people who quoted them. You can go and look up his book, you understand, Mexico or a history of Mexico. You understand, he's got a couple of different books. And what happened is, is that he started to study the Indians and started to, he was one of the first people to translate their oral traditions. Next slide. Long list of similarities between the Indian and Judaic ritual had been drawn to prove this thesis. It was pointed out that like the Jews, the Indians had tabooed certain animals as unclean. Like Jews, they had a sense of personal purity. They worshipped a great spirit, Yehovah. Uh, Come on, man. Uh, you understand? You know, damn right, it's Yahweh. Right, and right. they had high priests that had puberty rites. The Indians had important holy days in spring and fall corresponding to Passover and a two-day fasting period correlating to the Day of Atonement. The Indians had a lunar calendar, because we mark what? Our months by the moon. You understand? Come on, man. Hebrew, excuse me, it says, and there are superficial similarities between the Hebrew and Indian tongues. I mean, I gave you the garments. I gave you the phylacteries. I right. gave you the shield. Right. I'm giving you the customs. Right. I'm giving you the language. Right. You want to tell me the Mexicans ain't Israelites? It's not over yet. Next slide. So now this is all written by Diego Duran. He concluded that the Indians must be descended from the Jews. His opinion was based on the strange ways and customs. He starts breaking all this down. Everything you're reading is what he translated from their oral traditions. Next slide. So now this is further. He says, furthermore, he notices that the Indians of Mexico, let's be specific here, had traditions of long journeys, such as the one from Assyria to Arsareth. They also had traditions of flights, such as the exodus from Egypt. Other proofs included common traditions of earthquakes which swallowed evil men, just like what happened with Moses and Korah. Right, right. You understand that the ground opened up and anybody who challenged the true men of the Lord was swallowed up by the earth. And that they said, and objects, excuse me, and, and, and objects manna falling from heaven. Mm. Come on, man. And the fact that the old Indian had begun his tale of the origins of his people with the words, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That's the, that's the Mexican creation story. Next slide. By the last quarter of the 16th century, the works of men, meaning the 16th century, we're talking about the 1500s. So now, by the last quarter of the 16th century, the works of these men, Motalinia, Sahagun, which we read earlier, Duran, Tovar, Suarez, Peralta, had made the Aztecs' oral history available. It was not until the Aztecs' own views 
about their history became widely known that the obvious, though superficial parallels with Jewish traditions could be made. Because originally when they got here, they weren't concerned with who the natives were. They were concerned with business, with slavery, with gold. But then once again, you're starting to notice who was all the people that was noticing this? Friars, priests, because the priests were studying the scriptures. They knew the Bible. They were reading it every day. And they're like, why are the Indians circumcising it themselves? What, what are they doing with that ark? Why does this sound like Hebrew? Now you're gonna find out. I'm not, I'm not even gonna say it yet. We're gonna get we gonna get there. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me get the next slide. Nonetheless, he remained convinced that the most reasonable theory seems to be now. This is a whole nother cat, right? He says that they are descended from the ten tribes of Israel, especially the tribe of Issachar. Right. This descent was now once again, we didn't know this in 69. Right. So now who are they identifying? as Issachar. It was three writers. Give me the next slide. The only other writer this, excuse me, the only other writer this author found who accepted the Issachar variation of the Ten Lost Tribes was Balthasar de Medina. In his Cronica de la Santa Provincia de Santiago de Mexico of 1682, you can tell I practiced that one, right? Although Medina thought the South Americans and Yucatans were descendants of the father of Ophir. The Mexicans are originally of the ten tribes captured by Salamanza and the family of Issachar, right. whom the Indians recognized as their special ancestor. Uh, the Mexican uh, Indians said they come from Issachar. So y'all know better than them. Y'all know better than the Mexicans, right? Y'all know better than them. Y'all know better than the historians. Right. Y'all know better than the Most High. Nah, right. you don't. That's right. You understand? You better get in class under Commander General Yohanna. Right. Shut right. your mouth. Wear all black and learn something. Right. I feel like dropping the mic. I'm telling you, three times I want to do this. I'm not going to. I'm not going to. But it's all right. Next slide. Now, here's something else, too. I didn't have time to get into the Omex, but black and black folk. Stop trying to make this an African. Right. You know what I'm saying? That's right. Because this is clearly a Negro, but not that Negro. This is an Indian Negro. It's That's the right. Same. This, this is the, the, the Negro de la Tierra. That's the right. Indians of the land. The Negroes of the land. This is an Issacharite. This is a Reubenite. Do you understand? Because what they call them the Omex was really the first civilization here. And what you're going to find out is that if you start studying, all these different civilizations had trade groups. You understand, like the, 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 the Tainos were trading with them in, in, in Florida. They were trading with them. They were trading with the Aztecs. The Aztecs was trading with all these other different lands. Like there's a direct link between, between the Mayans and the, and the Aztecs and the Tainos. Why? Because they were all speaking the same language. Because they were all brothers and sisters of the lost tribes of Israel. That's right. That they knew that the sons of Joseph were on islands nearby. We knew that we were the tribe of Reuben. We knew that we were Issachar. That's right. Next slide. So now, this is about another 15 slides right here. Because y'all want to talk about Gad. Y'all want to try to say that my Gadite brothers are mongloids. He was a goddamn lie. You understand? So Gad, a troop shall overcome him, but he shall come overcome at the last. Gad was conquered by a troop. Yeah, I was conquered by the North American Indian Cavalry, conquered by the English kings, you understand, conquered by the Spanish, conquered by all of these people, you understand, but in the end, you understand, they're going to overcome, and how they going to overcome, you're going to find that. So now, Deuteronomy 33 and 20, and of Gad, he said, blessed be he that enlargeth Gad, meaning what? If you enlarge Gad, you're increasing him. What did, what did the so-called white man do to Gad? Did he enlarge him? Nah, he reduced him to reservations. Right. So if you're blessed for enlarging him, what does that mean you're going to do? If, you know, you're going to be cursed. You understand? A white man going to die for what he did to our people. That's right. 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 Dwell it as a lion. How does a lion dwell? Hmm. A lion hunts. Right. And what would Gad do? Gad would go all throughout the prairie and they would hunt the buffalo. That's right. They would use that for their teepees, for their booths. Right. That they would dye the top of it red, just like we used to do in ancient times inside the scriptures. And tear at the arm with the crown of the head. Meaning, what did Gad do to his enemies? 
He went and he took that, you understand, that tomahawk, put it to the scalp of his enemies, and tore back the crown. That's, That's what he's going right. to overcome in the end. Right. You understand? You telling me this is describing anybody else but the North American Indian? Uh, right. Come on, man. Y'all out your damn mind. And he provided the first part for himself because there in portion of the lawgiver was he seated, meaning what? Gad, when the kingdom split, Gad tried being the priesthood. That's why even today you could still see they wear their garments with the fringes and the border of blue. They still call their medicine men or their priest shaman. Right. You understand? Which is basically the Hebrew word for oil. That's you understand? Right. The Hebrew word for anointing. You understand? So now... They came over here with the heads of the people. He executed the justice of the Lord and his judgments with Israel. If you go and you look, yo, Gad would stone you if you practice witchcraft because you suffer a witch not to live. They would stone you if you committed treason, meaning if you broke the laws that they had in the land. That's the same thing that we would do in Israel. Next slide. What we got going on here? Was the star of Rem fan. <laughs> what you're seeing right here is a watercolor painting by George Barbier or Barbier in 1882 to 1932. He was painting all these different paintings, man. This also came out of, remember, the ethnology of America. And you see a Gadite sailing in his canoe with the shield of David right on it. Because once again, this is found in Peru. This is found everywhere amongst us, man. That's Next right. slide. The North American Indian, the following is from J.J. Mombert's History of Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, page 63. With an extent from the letter written by William Penn to the Committee of the Free, what they start to find out is that he states that the origin of the North American Indians, I am ready to believe them of the Jewish race. I mean the stock of the ten tribes, and that for the following reasons. First, they were to go to a land not planted or known, which to be sure, Asia and Africa, if not Europe, and all that intended into extraordinary judgment upon their passage might make the passage not uneasy for them. Meaning what? All those lands were already inhabited, as it is not impossible in itself that the easternmost parts of Asia and the westernmost parts of America in the next place, I find them like in the countenance. Now, he starts talking about all these different things. Starts talking about the coins that they found. Starts talking about uh, 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 how they have altars, feasts, tabernacles, all the same things that they found in South and Central America. Next slide. The Hebrew letters found engraved in the top rock at Ticonderoga and the sheens found in Georgia and the inscriptions on the shekel are evidence that those who were taken by Salomonessa in the reign of Hosea, they found coins that date directly back to the time of Solomon. Right. They found Hebrew coins with Hebrew letters, you understand, that go directly back to when Solomon was ruling, found all over America. Next slide. So now, are these the only artifacts they found? Hell no. You start to see the Newark Decalogue stone. They say the Decalogue stone, why? Because they found the Ten Commandments written on this stone in Newark, Ohio. Right. The Back Creek stone. Now, mind you, there's a lot more artifacts than this. Right. However, if they weren't found on an official Smithsonian dig, they try to say that it, it don't matter. They try to say that it's, it's illegitimate. But the thing is, is that all these were found by the Smithsonian. All these were found by archaeologists that they want to understand identify with. So so is the Back Creek Stone. That they took the Back Creek Stone and they didn't know what the hell it was. They threw it in a box for years. And somebody went pulled out and said, yo, we were reading this upside down. They flipped it over and said for the tribe of Judah. Right. You understand? The Los Lunes Stone. Once again, this is the Ten Commandments that the brother, where you at, brother? Right there. My man right there. My man knew. He knows history. You understand? This was Ten Commandments that was found caught into a rock inside of Mexico, New Mexico. The Hebrew petroglyph panel, meaning that you go and you look, they have petroglyphs of all Hebrew carved inside the Americas. The Tuscan lead artifacts, the earthworks that were found, the Newark Keystone, and the Newark Stone Bowl. Next slide. Just so you can get a visual. Hebrew on the Keystone. Hebrew all over the Decalogue Stone. The bowl of incense, you understand, burning. 
found with Hebrew on it. Next slide. This is the Bat Creek stone that they found in Tennessee, clearly with ancient Hebrew on it. Next slide. The Los Lunes stone. This is literally the Ten Commandments right here. Man. That's right. That's you right. understand? Literally. Next slide. Why is it the same ancient Hebrew carved into the side of it? Because this is the Decalogue stone that they also found. That, and once again, they find this in, in North America. They find this in South America. Right. They find this all over the place. Next slide. Yeah, now we get to chill. Okay? Well, I get to chill. Y'all watch. The Hopewell Mound Builders built hundreds of thousands of structures out of various types of earth materials. These structures included burial mounds, animal effigy mounds, forts, temples, and advanced geometric structures with lunar and solar alignments. Many of these structures have been leveled down and destroyed as the United States expanded west and built itself right over them. But some still exist today. Early U.S. settlers would create detailed survey drawings of some of these structures. There are a few good books which were published by the Smithsonian in the mid-1800s that show detailed survey drawings from the Ohio and New York areas. They're called Ancient Monuments of the Mississippi Valley, Aboriginal Monuments of New York, and Antiquities of New York. But there was a one-of-a-kind mound builder structure that was unlike all the rest, at least as far as I know. In 1823, Major Isaac Robert Doe of oh, the United right? States Army Corps of Engineers created this survey drawing. What that look like right there? Huh? I want you. What does this look like right here? A what? That's a menorah that they carved into the earth, and then they turn this into an oil lamp, and this is the oil lamp for the menorah. Hit play. Of a massive earth structure just southwest of present-day Fayetteville, Ohio. Notice the Hebrew oil lamp. Notice the nine-candle menorah. And notice other ancient and sacred symbols such as the compass and the square. Another drawing of this structure is included in one of the Smithsonian books I mentioned earlier, Ancient Monuments of the Mississippi Valley. And still, there are some who insist that this survey drawing was fake and that the structure never even existed. Unfortunately, the United States Army Corps of Engineers completely destroyed this structure in the early 1900s and leveled it into flat ground. But why? Was it an intentional attempt to erase this odd Hebrew structure from American history? You got that it was right. Simply out of carelessness and lack of respect for ancient American antiquity. So now the point is, is that they started to destroy our artifacts. And now, mind you, this is in the same place that they found the keystone. This is in the same place that they found the Decalogue stone. This is in the same place that they will find that all these Hebrew artifacts, and they leveled them and tried to keep them out of the history books. They said that there was more people living in Hope World than there probably was in Chicago today. They said that this was an ancient civilization, that they found a, 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 a footprint of a pyramid that was even bigger than that of, the, of uh, uh, in Giza. They started finding all this, but most of it was destroyed and then used to build some of the colonies and cities are built on top of it right now. I could do a whole lecture just on Hope World. I promise you. So now... We come right back now. This is also talking about William Penn, who saw and communicated with, the, he's talking about the Indians that he communicated with. On his first arrival in America, while their original uncontaminated state before they were debased and ruined by the connection with those who called themselves civilized Christians, meaning what? The more contact that we started to have with the so-called white man, the more we started to lose our culture, the more we started to lose who we are. That's why if you go in certain books, you might even find, like, for example, the Tainos. you got some books that say they were a matriarchal society. You have another book that'll say they were a patriarchal society, meaning men ruled. Some say women ruled. If you go and you look at the dates, the ones that were saying that the, the, it was patriarchal was before they were really destroyed. And the ones that said that it was matriarchal was after they were already conquered. Why? Because all the men are dead. All the men are working in the mines. 
You understand? And it's just like today. If they were to come look at the ghetto, they wouldn't say that men run it. They'd say women run the ghetto. Why? Because two million of us are in jail. You understand? Because how many of us is in the grave right now? You understand? So that means that the more that we get involved with their culture, the more that we start to lose who the hell we are. So now, they wore earrings and nose uh, jewels, bracelets on their arms. So he starts talking into how they dress. Next slide. I want to start moving a little quicker. We still got a lot more. Give me a next slide. So now, a lot of this came from the 10 tribes of Israel, North American Indian. So now this is all, this book is basically a compilation of James Adair, Ethan Smith, all the different writers who wrote about the North American Indians. They put all the excerpts in there. Next slide. So now, an old Charabi Indian, and in very early day, thus addressed one of these white people. Our people are become almost as bad as yours. We are so much altered since you came among us that we hardly know ourselves. And we think it is owing to some melancholy, a change, that hurricanes are more frequently here than formality, meaning they knew that the Lord controlled the weather. And they knew that these storms and their destruction was directly correlating with them following the white man, with them going into the ways of the Gentiles. You understand? Give me the next slide. So now, it says they're so degenerated, they cannot give tolerable accounts of the origin of their religious rites, ceremonies, and customs. So he starts talking about how they completely destroyed and conquered us that we didn't know who the hell we are. So if you go to a, a reservation now, or in the last 200 years, and you try speaking to them, and they say, oh, we're not the children of Israel, it's because we took that from us. But so you got to go to all the people who were studying us from the 15, 16, 1700s. And these are the accounts that they give us. Next slide. So now, it says that the Indian languages have never been reduced by any certainty by letters, but must be have been exposed to change and misconceptions. They try to say that we didn't have an alphabet, which is a damn lie. We're going to prove that tonight. It says... Uh, their awful example of white people, we are this day confined to few traces of their original language, their religious rites, customs, and few common traditions that may labor to be collected to form opinions upon. The Indian language in general are very copious and expressive, considering the narrow sphere in which they move, their ideas being few in comparison with civilized nations. They have neither cases nor... I can't even see that word right now. Declensions. They have few or no prepositions. They remedy this by affixes and suffixes, and their words are invariably the same, both in number. So meaning what? They start turning around and saying this is completely identical to Hebrew. This is just like the Mexican language. This is just like the Chilean language. This is just like the Mohegan verb. You understand? Because Hebrew don't have prepositions. It's attached to the word. You understand? Like, for, for example, Bahashem. You understand? You don't say it's not just ba ha. That ba ha sh, and ha is attached to the shum, which is in the name of. But that's the exact way that the language was. So now it starts talking about how expressive their speech was. Next word. Actually, the next slide. So now it says their language abounds with guttural and strong aspirations, which make it very sonorous and bold, like Yahweh ba Shem Yahweh Sha Baraka A bold language. You understand? You, you go and you take a look at the language of the so-called Jew. You understand that bastard. He turns around and he's going to say, Abala Yehuda, Kadaru La'ayi. You see how soft that is? You understand? You, you hear that in Hebrew, it's Yahweh the Kadar La'aratza. You understand? Guttural, bold. And it says that their speech abounds with metaphors after the matter of Eastern nations. What are we learning? The Orient. The East, all of us coming over from Israel. Next slide. It says, a deer records a sentence of the speech of Indian caption to his companions in his, or his, his oration for war. Near the conclusion, so now basically, this is what they said. It says that their guns were burning, their tomahawks were thirsty to drink the blood of their enemies, and their trusty arrows were impatient to be on the wing. And lest they delay, they should burn their hearts any longer. He gave them the cool, refreshing word to join the holy art. That sounds like something David would have said. That sounds like Psalms right there. Yeah, that's right. You understand? Right. Next slide. 
So now it said, it is said among their principal or beloved men that they have been handed down from their ancestors. Excuse me. Yo, hold on, hold on. I need y'all to pay attention to this. I need y'all to pay good attention to this. It is said among their principal or beloved men that they have it handed down from their ancestors that the book which the white people have was once theirs. What's the book that white people had when they came here? The Bible. You understand? They said, what the hell are you trying to do giving us our own book back? Give me the next slide. So now, the Indians to the east say that previous to the white man coming into this country, their ancestors were in the habit of using circumcision, but laterally not being able to assign any reason to it for such a strange practice. Their young people insisted on it being abolished. Because once again, as time started to go on, we couldn't remember why we were circumcised in our young. But meanwhile, once again, we were speaking Hebrew. We had the shield of David, but white people started to erase our culture. Next slide. The village where we once were consisted of 140 huts containing about 800 warriors, 50, excuse me, 1,500 women, and at least 2,000 children, and some Padukas having four wives. Just, you know, I got to throw polygamy in there real quick. Next slide. So now, the Indians will not cohabit with women while they are out at war. They religiously abstain from every type of intercourse, even with their own wives, for the space of three days and nights before they go out to war. This is the same thing that we would do. Oh, Joshua always say, purify yourself before we go to battle. It's the same thing they did with Gideon. It's the same thing we did any time we went to war because we had to be clean if we wanted the angels to be around us. We had to be clean if we wanted the Lord to be with us. You understand? Which is why it says this is the same thing that Joshua commanded. That they avoided themselves. They washed their clothes and avoided all impurities and matrimonial intercourse. When the Indians returned home victorious over an enemy, they sing the triumph song to Yahweh. What they're pronouncing is Yohiwa, ascribing the victory to him like the religious customs of the Israelites. They were calling their God Yahweh. And every time they won a battle, they would praise the Most High. Right. Give me the next slide. The Indians, also agreeable in that theocracy of Israel, think that the great spirits to be the immediate head of their state. And that God shows them out of all the rest of mankind. Meaning that they knew that we were dealing with the Most High. And that's who was the head of their government. Like they had the chiefs set up over their all different tribes, which is exactly what Moses did. Moses went and took wise men, made them chiefs among. And when you go and you look at the structures of the, of the uh, Native American Indians, it was the same exact thing. They set their government up exactly the same way that Moses did. Give me the next slide. Matter of fact, go back real quick. One other thing, too. Almost forgot this. It says, and they hold the white people in explicable contempt. We're not going to let that out. They charge the white man. You understand? Right. 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 So now, meaning that they literally, you understand, have trash words for the so-called white man, but they flatter their brothers as the beloved people. Next slide. So now, when any of their beloved people die, they soften the thoughts of his death by saying he has only gone to sleep with his beloved forefathers. This is the same thing that they said about David when he got the prophecy about Yahweh. It says, in the, when the day comes that you go and you rest with your fathers, all the parts of speech, all the parts of our customs and culture was the same. Next slide. So now, as the Israelites were divided into tribes and chiefs over them, so the Indians divided themselves. Each tribe formed a little community within itself. The sachem of each tribe is a necessary part from which conveys treaties. So meaning what? They had affixes and seals, you understand, that they used. Meaning what? They had standards. You go and you take a look right here. Manessa, Gad, Reuben. You understand? Just like we used to have seals and we used to use animals, the North American Indians were doing the same thing with their families. Their genealogical names, which they assume are derived from either the names of those animals, or matter of fact, they started to find cherubim amongst them. They started to find angels in some of these symbols and seals. They had families of the eagle, the panther, the tiger, the buffalo. 
You understand? The family of the bear, the deer. You understand? This is the same exact thing that we did. This is the same exact thing. You go and you take a look. Judah's the lion. Benjamin's the wolf. They took that with them as well. Next slide. No sweat. All right, listen, we're going to take a quick intermission and we're going to get back. Hey, listen, everybody. There's the refreshments in the back. Let's hit the lights. I can, if you feel, hit the lights. You know what I'm saying? It's, for, it's refreshments in the back or whatnot. Y'all know how Christ did it. So we doing it like that up in here. Yeah, who did this for me? I did that, so. <laughs> Most of <our> Christ. <laughs> so, hey, look, y'all, we got to, look, we got a nice little break or whatnot. 30 minute, 30 minute break, 20 minute break. Let's do a 20 minute break. Let's, you know what I'm saying? Y'all get y'all some food or whatnot. Hey, Akim, 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 if I could. Akim, Troopers. Troopers, let's, let's get this food circulated or whatnot. All right. Hey, you gotta remember that slide. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. What you doing now? Uh, <laughs> 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 He got it all. He's going on. What you need? I want to go to the Thank <laughs> you. 
That's just my part. We got to cut that computer Hey, Salaki, if I could, can I get y'all attention one second? One second, please. Hey, um, I know we I know we having a good time, you know what I'm saying? Election going crazy. But I got one one special, you know what I'm saying, thing I wanted to present to this, you know what I'm saying, to this lecture. This brother, you know what I'm saying, and put in so much damn time and creating a book and a talk about the Israelite school of UPK and the inception of the truth, the integrity that the seven heads had and the extra integrity that Commander General Yahweh had that's been passed down to us through the generals, the captains, the officers, the troopers and the sisters, y'all doing an excellent job at representing the nation of Israel. And this brother right here, officer of a thousand, excuse me, 5,000, <laughs> officer of 5,000, the Pantazar al decided to capture that and put it into some words and throw it in a book. And if, if I could get y'all attention, let the brother talk about it for a second. Go out, go out. Officer Department of Alabama, Officer 5000. Can't believe this is Shout out to everybody who came down to the Midwest Hotel. You can see the election going down. Uh, real quick, though, I just want to talk a little bit about this uh, book. I like to call it a pamphlet. You know, I like to look at it. It ain't a real thick book. What it's going to be is more of an introduction to the truth. Right, let me just tell you how it started. So basically, uh, we broke ground in Cincinnati last year. And when we broke ground in Cincinnati, we had camp, we had a little cookout, and I also did a lecture. And the lecture was called The Truth I Never Learned in the Christian Church, right? And so the lecture was pretty much all milk, but it was it was presented in a way that even a Christian got to look at it and be like, damn, man, that you know what I'm saying? You're speaking the truth there. And that's why it's titled The Truth That I Never Learned in the Christian Church. So... Damn right. Damn right. Give it up. Give it up. So, um, just quick, you know, counseling from Captain Marvel Pond, and you know what I'm saying? Obviously, the generals is behind the scenes. Captain Kapash, like, I put together what I think is going to be an amazing read for anybody who's never learned anything about the truth. And, and if I could, real quick, 
Yeah. It all came about because I was out on the website looking at the school's um, recommended book list, right? And as I ran across the school's recommended book list, I saw a pamphlet or a little book by a fake Israelite group. And the fake Israelite group, they got a little book out there. I, re I bought it off Amazon, read it, and it's trash. You understand? So uh, just like in, in this word of forewarning to anybody, if you want to do something, you present something to anybody in leadership in ICPK, they're going to give it to you. So <laughs> you understand? In that spirit, right, damn right. In that spirit, Captain Marquardt said, I think that the lecture that you did would be a great way, a uh, great thing to do to put it in words. And so that's what I did, man, you know what I'm saying, with the great leadership of managing how the, uh, the generals, the captains, you know what I'm saying, all of I'm looking for this to be done uh, towards the end of the year, maybe the beginning of December. I'm definitely trying to get it on Amazon. I'm currently looking at other avenues where it could be, you know, Barnes and Noble, whoever going to uh, get it posted. So look out for this book. It's definitely something that you want to give to somebody who don't know anything about the truth. They'll learn the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Hey, man, listen. This ain't no black and black shit. You understand? This right here is some real deal. You know what I'm saying? Real spill about what happened on how we got the truth that brought us all to Chicago today is exactly what's in that book. It's all exemplified by this brother. He did his research, intense research, got the order from Captain Mawakwa to do it. So I think it's important, I know it's important for us all to stand behind it because you got these fake ass Israelite groups that wear purple and fringes on the bottom of their shirt and they got a whole lot of goddamn zeal that they try to outclass the Israelite school UBK. That shit will never happen because in the end, there will only be one West. That's right. 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 So where your slide show at right there too. You gotta go back to that right there on the commercial. Go back to that book. Hold on, hold if it ain't, just go back to that old song. They call playing that on music. So all you gotta do is go back to your story. Yeah, 
Hey, Slock, everybody. We got about five more minutes worth of intermission. Get done what you got to get done now, and then we get right back into it, all right? Taking my own, 
So free, so I got to get so when I'm done, drop the mic, take, take it my own. So it won't fall in the hands of fuck niggas. Me, I play the cards, I'm dealt with Trump niggas. All on the top, they swear I can dump nigga. One, one, nigga, try to sit next to the trunk, nigga. But probably won't be ready to see me on front, nigga. Joe, that's like no good mean if you froggy by front, nigga. All right, y'all. Oh, for water. I want y'all to know, listen, a couple of things, Akiyam, and I go out there. Make sure y'all fill in these chairs. You know what I'm saying? I know we got a lot of people standing. Fill in all the chairs. You know what I'm saying? This way everybody can sit. Baba Kashab, y'all can let the people know outside. We got to begin again. Um, For the people at home, big ups to everybody who put a donation in. Once again, everybody fill in the chairs. I can let them know outside that we beginning. I hope y'all enjoying the lecture. Just so y'all know, listen, we went through 142 slides of information. We got about 45 left. Um, also, make sure that you cop some oils from Captain Azaria. He got them fire oils. I myself, I just bought some uh, fourth dimension black fire. If y'all want my music, sidebar. Anybody who buys my catalog, I'm giving that free mixtape too. I got the hard copies with me. Five for a mixtape, dollar for a single, 20 for the whole catalog. Holla at me after the show. You did. All right. I'm going to give y'all a couple of minutes to get, you know what I'm saying, seated, but we, we literally about to begin. All right. So let's get it together. And that goes for anybody online. If y'all want my music, just hit me directly. Brother, you good or you want to swap out with somebody? You all right? I'm, 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 I'm Christ. You've been rocking strong with me. While everybody's getting settled, once again, man, you know what I'm saying? Like, big the water that kept my quiet, this heavy hitting crew. That's right. You know what I'm saying? Clap it up. Come on, clap it up. Make some noise. Clap it up. I need, all y'all ain't clapping. Clap it up. Come on. There we go. I want to I wanna let y'all know, they, they, they said, what y'all need for this lecture? I said, I need a projector. They went and got me a projector. That's right. I said, I need a laser pen. They went and got me a laser pen. That's right. I said, I need some, some scotch. They went and got me my favorite scotch. Damn right. I needed a glass. They got me a glass. That's right. And I said, I need a bowl of just blue M&M's. <laughs> Now, I was just kidding, but they went crazy about the m and they, they were like, we got to get a bag and just pick out the blue ones? What are we about to do? I was just kidding. I'm not that bougie. <laughs> but if I did want that, they would have did it. Captain, Ma, excuse me, Captain DeBar called me up. He said, we treating this like Jay-Z coming to town. I said, you hungry. Now, Jay-Z a wicked nigga in the world, but he knows. So I appreciate you. You know what I'm saying? Once again, filling all the seats, filling all the chairs. If you if you watch him right now, remember this lecture was supposed to be for a twenty dollar donation. So please make your donation, support the school, support this truth, support this information. How y'all feeling so far? Y'all feeling good? It's clear. Everything's clear. Most on Christ. I, I actually I talked about Dan already. You should have been here earlier. <laughs> I can't help your lateness. <laughs> All right. All right, so slide 143. So now, we went through majority of the Northern Kingdom. Right now, we're currently in Gad. You understand? So, I can also, I know y'all, if y'all get your food, let's keep it down, though, all right? Most time on Christ. All right, so now, we're talking about Gad. We're talking about the North American Indians. The Indians, however, bear no religious respect to the animals from which they derive the names of their tribes, but will kill any of their species when opportunity serves. Meaning what? Israel has never been religious. And that's why they try to understand our religion. We don't have a religion. We have a culture. And if you study our culture, that's when you see we practice circumcision. If you study our culture, that's when you see we carry an ark to war. That's when you see we separate ourselves from women when they're unclean. 
we separate ourselves from sisters to not sleep with them before we go to war so the Lord will be with us. Right, that's right. We set, we go and we, we, we lock ourselves in for the Sabbath day and don't work on that day. You go and you look at all this. This was happening in North, Central, and South America. Well, there is no tribe or individual among them, however, by the name Apostle, which is the Cherokee still Sakia, which is the Kota Indians Shuka, synonymous with that of the Hob. Remember, none of these tribes were eating pork. Right, right. None of these tribes were eating swine. Right. And none of these tribes, although they'll name themselves just like we did with our sigils, with our standards, none of them will name themselves after a pork, after hog, after swine. You understand? And they formally reckoned it as a filthy and uneatable animal. Why? Because once again, they said that this is our customs of our forefathers. Because they knew that our forefathers were Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's right. Next slide. So now, for everyone has his own family or tribe, and when one of them is speaking, either of the individuals or habitation of them, any of his tribes say, he is of my house, or it is of my house. This is like Bayath Dawada. You understand? When King David prayed in the divine wrath, you understand? This is the same thing. It was always the house of David. Well, we talked about our houses. When Indians are traveling in their own country, they inquire for a house of their own tribe. And if they, excuse me, and if there be any, they go to it. They are kindly received, though they never saw this person before. Meaning what? This is the law of the stranger. The law of the stranger ain't talking about taking care of no white man. It's talking about a brother or sister that you never knew. Let me tell you something. I don't know Captain Malquad outside of his truth. You understand? And he put me up inside his house. You understand? Oh, Captain Zakar. Captain Zakar is famous for, for housing brothers internationally who come down for the Passover. You understand? Slept on the floor next to some of these brothers, man, that come from all over the world. And you know what? He puts them up and he says, this is your house. He goes to his slavery. And he's like, you know what I'm saying? Just be cool. You know what I'm saying? Whatever. You know what I'm saying? Make sure the brothers got what they need. Not make sure the brothers got their blankets. The brothers got their pillows. Because we take care of the strangers, the people who's our family, the people who's one West. Because this is the law of the stranger. Don't ever try to give that to another nation. That's right. Let me get another, let me get another slide. On. So now I want you to pay very close attention. You see this right here? This is this is how Gadites would dress it. Right? Next slide. This look like General Q right here at the last Passover. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, with the garment, with the fringes. You see the border of blue right there going all the way up the sleeve? Right. And now notice that it's rough material. It's cowhide. Right. Notice, like, I hate the word, but notice the swag that they got going on, the style that they got going on. This is very important because I want you to pay attention when I bring Ruben up because Ruben's coming up next. Next slide. Now, also, on the cowhide, also, this was a warrior's portrayal of a puberty dance. What y'all see right here? You understand? Y'all see the Magundawada again in North America. Because this is what we did. This is who we were as a people. That's the symbol of our nation. The sigil of our empire. Next slide. Reuben the Seminole Indians. Reuben, thou art my firstborn. This was the firstborn of Israel. My might. And the beginning of my strength. Let me tell you something. There's so I, I probably could have put about 30 slides together for Reuben. Like Reuben to this day is still at war with the North American Indians. Reuben is one of the only tribes that was actually able to fight off the Spanish. Like when you go and you go down to the Aztecs, to the Incas, to the Mayans, when they were fighting the Spanish, like even remember earlier I brought up Galvarano. Galvarano, even though he had those those blades tied to the nubs of his arm. They still lost to the Spanish because they couldn't pierce their armor. Let me tell you something. They had a long bow that they were using flint and snake bones and busting through that armor, killing the Spanish. You know, but give the Lord, give the Lord a hand. Give Reuben a hand. You know what I'm saying? They were killing the Spaniards who came there. To this day, Reuben is the only one that wasn't conquered because of that strength, because of that excellency. That's the Seminole Indians right there. You understand? It says the excellency of dignity. Now, Reuben was known as the civilized nations. Even the white man respected Reuben. Right. Even the white man noticed their dignity that they had. 
their honor that they had, the excellency of power. Now, unfortunately, unstable as water. Now, what does unstable as water mean? It means that your ways are movable. It means that you're not locked directly into the truth. And if your ways are movable and you're not locked directly in the truth, then you're liable to do something like this. Thou shalt not excel because thou wentest up into thy father's bed and defiled him. He went up into my couch. Which meaning what? Reuben went and he slept with his stepmother. You understand? And as a result of that, this is why, like, they don't have no Aztec Incan Empire or nothing like that. You know what I'm saying? Listen, I went to a Seminole County. I used to live in Florida. I ain't meeting not one Seminole. You know what I'm saying? And that's because of what he did in his ancestry. This, that's because of what his forefather did. Now, that doesn't mean he didn't have that dignity. I mean, even if you look back to when they tried selling Joseph into slavery, the reason why they didn't kill Joseph, my personal forefather, is because Reuben said, don't kill him for our father's sake. Even in wickedness, he had some dignity. Right, right, right. Now, I talk about sidebar, a little joke. I talk about this with Captain Zarya. He was talking about, he goes, yeah, Judah, we sold, we sold your ass into slavery. I said, yeah, then you came back begging for food stamps, didn't you? <laughs> just, just a little bit of a joke. I ain't trying to split the kingdom again. It's one nation now. All right. You can tell that drink kicked in, right? Next slide. Now, look at how they dress. Look at the dignity. Look at the pride. Look at the metri that they had. Look at the same headpiece that you saw in that petroglyph in Puerto Rico. And when you take a look at them, look how look how separately they dress right from that rough cowhide of gag. You understand? Take a look, like, like this This looks like a dignitary you send to go talk to an emperor or something. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? Like, we got a king in Israel. Who are we going to send to go talk to this cat about opening trade negotiations? We're going to send Reuben. Right. Reuben going to be the dignitary. You understand? This is the Seminole Indians. Now, let's get into a little bit of history and understanding of Reuben. Next slide. The Creek. This is another, this is another name for the Seminole. The Mohegans is another name for the Seminoles. This is the collection of these nations. Is there? The Creek and the American Indian people originally from the southeast of the United States, not to be confused with the Creek, who are found in Canada. The Creek are also known by their original name, Muskegee. Now, remember what we said earlier. What was the Muskegee verb? What was the Muskegee language? It was molded in Hebrew. You understand? Their language, Muskegee, is a member of the Creek branch of the Muskegon family, and we know that their language was Hebrew. And they were known as the five civilized tribes. Why? Because Reuben had that respect and dignity even amongst his enemies. Next slide. Now, the term Seminole is a derivative of Cimarron, which means wild men. Why? Because they are unstable as water. These are wild men. These, these are men that you cannot mess with, that you cannot conquer, that they ain't make no treaty with the so-called white man. You understand? The original Seminoles were given this name because they were the Indians who had escaped from slavery in British-controlled northern colonies. When they came to Florida, they were not called Seminoles. They were actually Creeks, the Indians of Muskegee derivation. The Muskegon tribes comprised of the Mississippi, the Mississippian culture, which were temple mound builders. Remember what we talked about the mound builders earlier, and pay attention to this word, Appalachian. The Appalachian was one of the five tribes or families that made up of this Seminole family, these Seminole tribes. Next, next slide. Though some of the tribes actually owned African slaves, the Seminoles never did. Stop trying to put that on the Seminoles. And matter of fact, this is what most of Gad did. Indeed, many black Africans escaping from slavery in the Carolinas and Georgia came to Florida and built settlements near the Seminoles. They formed a union with the Seminoles based upon both of their mutual fear of slavery, meaning they realized we have a common enemy, the so-called white man. Right. We better join together or we're both going to be enslaved. Right. And they stayed free. That's right. You understand? That's right. Which well, lets you know what the hell that we got to do. That's right. Straight up and down. The U.S. never was able to break them apart. You understand? The Union was so strong, it surpassed the attempts of the U.S. to break them apart. That's one West, baby. You understand? That is the ISUPK and the Commanding General Yohanna. Clap it up now. So now, they were so closely allied that the blacks became known as the Black Seminole. And that's how it's supposed to be. Next slide. 
So now, this is all talking about, you understand, this is from a book right here, The Propagation of the Gospel, Numerous Facts and Arguments, Indians in America, and now it's trying to say that are descended from the ten tribes of Israel. So these are all different various writers, right? Matter of fact, big ups to Officer Zaka War for this. Officer Zaka War gave me this, you understand, this information. He sent it to me. I read this book in like a night. There's so much more information, including the fact that Africans and the so-called white man were both calling Judites in Africa Negroes. Sidebar. We're going to save that for part two of this lecture. The, so now it starts talking about the F, the 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 it starts talking about the authors of this. Dr. Jonathan Edwards from a time ago communicated to the Society of Arts in Connecticut to form indigenous observations of the language. If I mess up, it's because this is written in Old English and there's F's instead of S's. And it says of the Mahiganu Indians. So this is talking about the Mahigan herd. It says that the extent of the language in North America, tracing the connection thereof with Hebrew. Indeed, it is no it, it is no small proof of their Jewish descent. I mean, this is big proof right here. And this is the second scholar to say the Mohegan language was Hebrew. You understand? So there's nothing but sources when they study this, what the hell language we were speaking. So now it's talking about, once again, their pronouns, their prefixes, their suffixes. How's the Hobbes a Hebrew scholar? In here? You understand? So it's General Q. Should have went to rank order to lock here. But when you go and you understand, you understand what these prefixes and pronouns and suffixes is and how the only language who has that is Hebrew, which is why it's so easily identifiable. Next slide. So now they start talking about how it differs from all the ancient languages and modern languages in Europe. Meaning what? What is all the European languages? They all have vowels. My man, you, you know something. This man right here. You understand? So now, our language has just class A vowels. It's just ah, I. You know what I'm saying? But everything else is consonants. Ah, ba, ga, da, which they consider a very barbaric language. So now, some customs seem also well authenticated among the Indians that appear to be a remnant of the Jewish religion. So now, we're still talking about the Mohegans. We're still talking about them in the South. It says... So now it starts talking about how they have religious dev devotion. The he they practice the Hebrew Passover. All they talk about is their forefathers, which is all that we do. You understand? Talks about how they mourn for the dead. Some suppose too many difficulties about the conveyance of, of the Indians. So now it starts talking about all these different Indians. So now I want to come over here, right? So now it starts talking about the Creek Indians and it starts talking about all the different things that they would do inside their tribe. Y'all see, hold on. Y'all see down here? It starts talking about Georgia, East. And it starts talking about all these different things, how they celebrated the Passover, all their religious and spiritual traits, all going back to Israel, all have to do with Reuben. Next slide. Now, the last remar remarkable fact to be made, this is the Indian woman. Right now, this is all talking about Reuben. So it says, in the separation of their woman on certain occasion, the southern Indians, now remember where Reuben was. Reuben was in Georgia. Reuben was in Florida. Reuben was inside these places. So now when it mentions the southern Indians, this is who it's talking about, obliged their women into the lunar retreats to build small huts at considerable distance from their dwellings because what would you have to do with a woman when she was unclean when we were in the kingdom? She had to separate and go stay in her own dwellings. Solomon Bowling out of control, built the house for each one of his women. Women, don't think you spoil. We in captivity, man. Right. <laughs> right. So now, it says, and their dwelling houses they imagine to be sufficient where they are obligated to stay at risk of their lives. Should they be known to violate this ancient law, they must answer to every misfortune that the people meet with. Among the Indians on the northwest of Ohio, the conduct of women seem perfectly agreeable as far as circumstances will permit with the law of Moses. Young women at the first change in her circumstances immediately separate herself, meaning what? Her flower, her period, herself from the rest, but made some distance from the dwelling houses and remained during the whole time of her met ma maladay or seven days. Where else were women supposed to be separated for seven days if not for Leviticus, the 15th chapter? The person who brings her visuals is very careful not to touch her. And so cautious is 
she touching of her own food with her hands, that she makes use of sharpened stick instead of a fork, with which she takes up her vent venison and small ladle of spoon for her other. Next slide. Food. When the seven days are ended, she bathes herself in water, washes her clothes, and cleans the vessels as she has made of use. This is Leviticus. This is Levitical law among Reuben. How do we know now? Once again, a Muskegee woman delivered a child is separated in the manner of three moons or 84 days. So now, once again, by the Levitical law, a woman was to be separated and unclean for 40 days for a man child. And 80 for a female child. So what you're starting to see is once again, we start to keep all these laws. This is what Reuben was doing. This is the Muskegee. This is the Creek. This is the Seminole. This is Reuben. Let's take it a step further. Next slide. Yo, when I found this, I wanted to kick a hole in the goddamn wall. I called, I called Captain Zaya, General Mahayim, and Enzako, and Captain Zaka. I'm putting some respect on your name, man. You know what I'm saying? I wanted to lose my mind. So now, recently discovered the original copy of the migration legend of the Creek people. They said this is not a legend. This is a goddamn map of migration to where they went. Give me the next slide. So now, remember earlier, I told you I need y'all to pay attention. Montezinos, who possessed the manuscripts of Luis Lopez, the learned bishops of Quito. Where is Quito? Quito's in Peru. A Portuguese mariner, once again, he studied this in South America, the Jews of the Ten Tribes. Next slide. So now, this Portuguese mariner, Anthony de Montezinos, arrived in Amsterdam after having lived some years in South America. Next slide. So when he arrived back there, after he was locked up, he said, yo, those were the lost tribes. So when they had this conversation, Shema Yasha'ala Yahweh Lahayanawa Yahweh Akkad, when they had this conversation about Reuben, that they met Reuben, and Reuben said that the tribes of Joseph were on islands nearby, they were in Peru. Well, what the hell was Reuben doing in Peru? Next slide. What apparently blew the minds of Ivy League scholars was that the elite of the Appalachian, remember the Appalachian was one of the five civilized nations of the Seminoles, were obviously of Peruvian origins. So when they met Reuben in Peru, it's because Reuben started in Peru. And when they traced this migration, they went from Peru and they went into Florida, into Georgia, because Reuben is the Seminole Indians. Right. Don't tell me the ISUBK don't got the truth. You don't know a goddamn thing outside of here. Right. Next slide. Three other migration legends. So now, when you go and you break down these legends, it talks about where they went, talks about who they thought they were connected to. And originally, now this is what's even more amazing, the Appalachian Creek migration legend arrived from the Atlantic Ocean, meaning that the Bering Strait is bullshit. Probably sailing the Gulf Stream northward. High King Chickaly described their first town as being located in downtown Savannah after they migrated up. Appalachia is a Muskegon pronunciation of a Peruvian word that means offspring from the sea. Because we came from the Atlantic. Because we are those tribes who came to Arsaref. We are those people who left the captivity of Salamanzar and came over here to try to serve our God. Next slide. Now we have the Southern Kingdom. Most You can see he's biased. <laughs> I ain't mad at you. Now, for the record, don't be mad at me. I don't got as much archaeology because when I argue with somebody online, they don't say that Judah is not the Negroes unless they pan Africanist. Right. All these fake Israelites, oh, Judah's all the Negroes. <laughs> you understand? They got a problem with the Mexicans, which is why I gave y'all 20 slides. Right. They got a problem with the Indians, which is why I gave y'all two hours of nothing but the Indians speaking Hebrew, living Hebrew, right. so on and so forth. Israelites, lost tribes. So now, Judah is a lion's wealth. 
from the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stoopeth down, he crouched down as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall ruse him up? You take a look at how Judah is inside this captivity. Judah is the lion, but like, who's going to rile him up? You know what it takes to get Judah to riot? Now, rioting is wrong, but you know what it takes for us to just not march and actually go and fight back against our oppressor? But I'll tell you who's going to rile him up. The ISUPK. That's right. right. Stand under right. Command That's General right. Yohanna. That's, That's who's going right. to rile him up. That's we got right. no hope for that. Place. So now, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. Why? Because all the major kings came from Judah, came from David's line, because Yahweh is our king, is a Judite. And it says, now, until Shiloh come, meaning what? Meaning that even until... Yahweh comes, even until the king of peace comes, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be, which is why you see all these tribes in here right now, which is why if you were to pan this, we got a Benjamite right here, we got an Ephraimite right here, we got a Judite right here, oh, what else we got going on down here? We got all the tribes up in here tonight, damn near. You understand why? Because we serve our king Yahweh Shah, because that's what was going to unite our nation back together. So now, the binding of his foal onto the vine and onto his ass's coat onto the choice vine. He washed his garment in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Because remember, they try calling Yahweh Shah wine bibber. They try saying that he drank too much. Now, once again, you can't please a hater. You understand? Like, like, like they saw John, and John was in a perpetual state of fasting. And they were like, oh, he must have a demon. And then they saw Yahweh Shah, and he wasn't fasting all the time. He was drinking that choice vine. And what they do, they turn around and say, he had a devil too. He's a, he's a wine dipper. You can't please a hater. You understand? So I don't expect to please too many haters inside here. I bet there's someone likes on that stream. I told you what I feel about you earlier. So now, his eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white with milk. You understand? Because how shall he like the finest things? He read them. Oh, excuse me. Next slide. The water. So now, Benjamin. Benjamin shall shall raven as a wolf in the morning, and he shall devour, excuse me, devour the prey. And at night he shall divide the spoil. Benjamin still lives like a pack. Benjamin is a very tightly knit group to the point where they almost practice tribalism sometimes. You understand? And tribalism is satanic. We twelve tribes, twelve different flavors, one nation. Don't ever forget that. You understand? But Benjamin is actually one of the only tribes that they'll actually go stick together and open up a restaurant right, still. Right, right. Most of most of the uh, other restaurants inside of black owned, you understand, restaurants inside the nation is what? It's Benjamin spots. Because they join together and then they divide the spoil until what? Until that American individualism sets in. And then everybody starts going their separate way. And Benjamin, he said, the beloved of the Lord shall dwell in safety by him, and the Lord shall cover him all the day long, and he shall dwell between his shoulders. Benjamites live crazy lifestyles, man. I thought to some Benjamins, they, they tell me stories, I don't know how they're still alive today. It's because the Lord is with them. It's because the Lord loves the youngest son of Israel, Benjamin. And that's why they always on their mind. That's why you listen to Anthony B., Bunt Down Sodom. That's why you listen to Steel Pulse, Burning Spear. That's why whenever you listen to their music, they always talk about the scriptures, and it's never considered gospel music. It's never considered something that you separate from. It's always something that sounds hard as hell. You know what I'm saying? Because the Lord is always dwelling between his shoulders. And what's between your shoulders, your head, is always on Benjamin's mind. You understand? Next slide. Now, Simeon and Levi are brethren. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. Why? Because you go and look. Listen. Them Levites, they won their independence, sort of. You understand? Because they was not playing with that voodoo or that santeria. You understand? Dominicans, too. Dominicans is so wicked. They over there killing their brothers. Why is they killing their brothers on the same island? Well, it goes into, oh, my soul, come not thou between their secret. Unto their assembly, mine honor, be not thou united. For in their anger, they slew a man. And in their self-will, they dig it down a wall. So... His father said, y'all two can't come together. Y'all two come together. Y'all burn down the world. Burn down the world. So both of these tribes are on the same island. We already proved that Israelites were on Hispaniola. So now we know that these is the tribe of Levi. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce. 
and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. And they're divided until when? Until Shiloh come. Until Yahweh Shah came. And now you sit you come into New York, man. You see Officer Yatza and you see Officer Zaka War. You see a Haitian and a Dominican. You see Simeon and Levi join together and their habitations ain't cruelty no more. Now they're trying to wake up the 12 tribes of Israel. Next slide. Babylon and Timbuktu. A lot of whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa, who brought the cool kid? Bear with us for a second. Who was that? Yeah, it, 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 no, it's all right. Don't move your foot. Press that button. That button right there. You reset You reset the projector. Just give it a second. Let it cut off. Boom. We back. All right. Give the Lord a hand. Babylon and Timbuktu. too. Many of you are familiar with this book. Come on with it. Next slide. So now, in the year 65 BC, the Roman armies under General Pompey captured Jerusalem. In 70 AD, General Vespasian and his son Titus put an end to the Jewish state with great slaughter. During this, during this period of military governors of Palestine, many outrageous and atrocities were committed against the residue of the people. During the period from Pompey to Julius, it has been estimated that over a million Jews fled into Africa. Fleeing from Roman persecution and slavery, the slave markets were full of black Jews. So now, we know that this is true. Why do we know that this is true? Give me the next slide. Because we got archaeology on it. This is the Judea captor coin. This is, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles. This was a prophecy that was fulfilled. And in 70 AD, the Gentiles came and downtrodden on our brothers, on our sisters. And those that were not lucky enough to flee were either killed or they were taken into Rome and they were thrown into the pits. They were thrown in there to be eaten by lions. They were thrown in there because they read the Bible and saw that Daniel was in a lion's den. Let's see if they survived this. Next slide. They left black. The war for Israel. When he was asked about peace in the Middle East, there would never be no peace in the Middle East. It might be rain in Spain, though. The late president of Egypt, Gamal Abed Nasir, stated the Jews will never be able to be here in peace because they left here black, but they came back white. Remember what the scripture says. They take crafty counsel against my people, my hidden ones, Israel, that the name of Israel shall be no more in remembrance. Let us cut them off from being a nation. They all know. Why the hell don't they tell us? Because you don't educate a slave. Because as long as Israel is on the bottom, they can stay in rulership. Next slide. You come down here. Listen, this right here is Nazis. And they went and did the research, and they found out that this was a bastard. This was not the real Jew. They said that the Negroes were the real Jews. Next slide. You go in the corner. You understand? This was Hitler inside of a movie theater. In one segment of Nazi instructional, they turned around and realized that they traced the heritage of the Jews to the Orient Negro, you understand, the near Asian. They turned around and realized that the Jews were black. Even Hitler knew the Jews were black. Now, they tried to connect us to the land of Ham. You understand, not understanding that, remember what the Zondervan Bible Dictionary says, not the Negro. Right, right, you understand? Right, right. Next slide. So now, remember that there was on the map the slave port known as Judah. Well, everybody tries to knock it. Well, if that's the case, then why is it if you go to this French website? You understand? I don't know who Judah Awakens 28 is, but I got this information from him. So, I mean, that's about all the big ups I'm going to give you until you come inside here. Right. You understand? But you go and you look. All these slaves that were being shipped, Judah, 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 Judah. That's the slave port that they came from. Why was they coming from a slave port called Judah? Because those were Judites over there. Because those were the Jews. Right. Because collectively... Judah, Benjamin, and Levi was called what? Judah, the Jews. Next slide. So now, if you also, once again, start to go with all these Portuguese, that's why this is written in Spanish right here, it starts talking about how they believe that West Africa was indeed populated by a remnant of the scattered inhabitants of Israel. And this is what they was teaching. This is what they were saying when they went over there and started to study some of these tribes that was over in West Africa. 
They said, these is the Jews that we're enslaving. These are the Jews that we're conquering. Next slide. So now, why don't we know about this? The white man of the devil. Yeah, give him a hand. Right, right. He said, the white man of the devil. Now, can I prove it? When diving into the depths of history, you have to realize that everyone has an agenda. I, I, for the word, I wrote this. I'm just going to pat myself on the back. Let me stop. I'm just playing around. So now it says, figuring out what their agenda and intentions are is the majority of the battle in finding out the truth. Examples we know is that the transatlantic slave trade in recent history was turned, they tried to turn into a migration. Now, this is why there's two things. You understand the devil, Napoleon Bonaparte said, what do you say? History is written by the winners. That's right. You understand Malcolm X, our confused brother over in Islam, he turned around. He said, if you want the truth, you have to look on the side of the oppressed. So that's why you have to find out, was this written by someone who's on the side of the oppressed? Or was this written by someone who's a conqueror? Well, I'm about to show you some stuff right now. Give me the next slide. This is Origins of the American Indians, European Concepts, 1492 to 1729. He, this cat went and looked up every single author of the American Indians. This is basically like, how many of you have heard of the black image in the white mind, or in the mind of whites? Y'all heard of that book? Okay. That was a conversation that took place over 100 years about what they should do with the Negroes. Well, this is the Indian image in the white mind. And this was a conversation that took place over damn near 500 years, you understand? And they were turning around trying to understand what the hell was up with the North American Indian. Next slide. Justin Winsor's narrative in A Critical History of America, this was in Boston, 1889, Wilson asserted that perhaps the most favored view among early Spanish settlers was that the Indians were not really human. He hinted that the popularity of the theory might be related to the Spanish desire to enslave the Indians. Meaning that there was a council that took place. This was like, uh, you know how they have foreign councils today? Well, this was a foreign council of Indian relations. And they said, if you can prove that the Indians don't have humanity, then you can enslave them. So that's why you have authors who had bids inside slavery that would make money off of slavery. And what they did was they would make propaganda to try to treat us like we were savages. So they would be justified in enslaving us. Next slide. The expansion of the argument. So now this is still in the 1500s. Only two theories seem to have appeared in that period. No doubt that were discussed, except for Oviedo and Venegas. They did not reach printed pages. So you have a lot of things that they wouldn't even allow to be printed. The most vital questions concerning the Indians did not deal with their origins in the beginning. Remember, we're talking about 1540. We're talking about only, what, 48 years since Columbus landed? So now, it's talking about more how they got to the New World. The questions focused on whether the Indians were capable of becoming Christians, meaning what? Slaves. Whether they should be converted peaceably or forcibly. Whether they were rational beings possessed of the rights of Europeans or whether they should be enslaved or if already enslaved, liberated. This is what they were discussing because all they cared about was the gold. Next slide. The most famous Spanish humanitarians, Bartholomew de la Casa, wrote on the origins of the Indians in two works not published in his lifetime, Apologetica Historia, completed in 1550, meaning he was one of the first people that was over here. So now, when you take a look at his works, this is what he said. Now, this is why I say you have to understand the agenda of the person who was, who was uh, 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 teaching, right? So now he starts to turn around and he adds to the literary debate. Two reasons for their inclusions, they are illustrative in the thinking of men intimately involved in the condition of the Indian. And they indicate that Lacassus did not hold an opinion commonly attributed to him, that the Indians descended from the lost tribes of Israel. He was one of the first authors to say this. Now, why? Notice that they called him a humanitarian, right. meaning that his, he didn't have no money making. He wasn't trying to make money off the gold and the slavery. He went down there as a missionary trying to befriend the Indians. And as a result from studying their culture, he found out 
that they were keeping all the laws of the Bible. So now this is somebody whose agenda that you could trust. Why? Because he didn't have a political agenda. He genuinely was just trying to study them. Let's take it a step further. Go ahead. One of Lacasa's greatest enemies in his battle for humanitarian treatment of the Indians, Francisco Lopez de Gamara, in the secretary and the biograph of Hernando Cortez, contributed to the debate. In 1552, Lopez de Gamora published Historia General, basically the general history of the Indies. In this book, it was composed in two parts, a general history and a chronicle of New Spain, New Spain being Mexico. So in this, this is what they did. The author despised the Indians and filled his volume with outrageous characterizations of them. He stated that their principal god was the devil, that they engaged in sexual and public sexual intercourse like animals, and they were the greatest sodomists, that they were liars, ingrates, and the source of syphilis. Come on, you know damn well the white man is the source of syphilis. He further contended that many were cannibals and knew nothing of justice, that they went shamelessly nude, and they are like stupid, wild, and sent asses prone to novelties and drunkenness. This is the argument that he made to the Council of the Indies. And he says that they do not deserve liberty. Next slide. So now, when they said this, right, the whole reason why that he was La Casa's enemy is because La Casa turned around and said, this cat never even been to New Spain. He was just writing what Cortez wanted him to write because Cortez was the one who invaded the Yucatan Peninsula. So because they invaded the Yucatan Peninsula, they were trying to justify their actions towards the Indians inside their province. That was the whole point of it. Next slide. Come on, stay with me. Yeah? Now, this is another book courtesy of Officer Zaka War. You get what I'm saying? This is all up here is all talking about the history proving that the Israelites are the Mexicans and so on and so forth. We got enough of that information tonight. Now, this is why we don't know. This is very important. I'm going to have to read everything on these slides coming up, so bear with me. It's going to be a lot of information, all right? Now, the Mexican paintings seem to have become objects of suspicion and mistrust, even in, the, in Europe. The first that were sent to Spain came to Charles V in 1519. Peter Martyr mentions them, and his description corresponded merely with exactly the depiction of the paintings. So they talk talking about the paintings, and it says they contained in it, it says that they are not unlike Hebrew letters. They start saying that on these paintings, they find in Hebrew letters. Give me the next slide. So now, when you start to see it, they start talking about, hold up. Let me try to find the direct part. They see the information. They know the Mexican language. He must therefore have known the use of the paintings. Bong, bong, bong. Now, boom. So they went and they started to burn all these paintings. They started to destroy all these paintings. So now, once they started to see that, right? So it talks about the companions of Cortez who had been over there in New Spain, over in Mexico. They start talking about all this. Rigid orders were given shortly afterwards to the bishop and clergy of New Spain. Remember, New Spain is Mexico to cause them all to be burned. They wanted to burn all these paintings and illustrations among the Indians that had Hebrew on them. Spain passed some extraordinary laws prohibiting lawyers, surgeons, literates, Jews, heretics, and descendants of the third generation of all persons suspected by the Inquisition and foreigners of all sorts who had not received permission from Seville from passing over into America. Now, why? Because these are people who don't follow Catholicism. These are people who don't follow the religious dogma of Spain. So what would they do? They would question the history of the Indians. So if they brought them over here, what would they do? They would do what Diego Duran did. They would do what Bartholomew de la Casa did. They would prove the humanity of the Indians. And if you prove the humanity of the Indians, you couldn't enslave them. Mm. So they tried to prevent as many of these people who would come over here. Father Joseph Gamilla says in page 59 of the Aronco Illustratus, 
It says, I affirm in second place that the nation of Aronko and its streams observed may be Hebrew. Next slide. We on the next slide? It says, so it starts talking about their ceremonies. It starts talking about, remember, their religious rites, ceremonies, even their ceremonial law. The Indians closely resembled those of the Jews. So because they started to notice this, they turned around. And Cortez discovered the Jewish religious, excuse me, the Jewish religion established in Mexico. And it's easy to assign that this is why they delayed the regular clergy from Spain. Because they turned around and what they started to realize is that the people who would be followers of Cortez in the military, it would have been overlooked. But they knew that if they would have brought laymen over here, men who studied the Bible, they would have made the connection to who we were. So they tried to prevent them from coming over. I should, oh man, I want to drop the mic again. Give me the next slide. So now, remember what, remember this cat from earlier, right? He was one of the authors. Sagun, Sa, Sa when engaged in the compilation of his works after he had taken away from him and restored, he received three cautions, meaning that the government came and read his works. And they said to write nothing to prove that the Hebrews had colonized the new world. They wanted to forbid him from saying this. It says to be guarded on what he said of devils having imitated God's people, meaning there was a theory that was created that they were so against the idea and notion of the Indians being Jews that they turned around and said, yo, if the, the, the devil must have did this to trick us. So now let's take it a step further. They wanted to, they, they came over here, right? And they started talking about how, according to Lord Kingsborough, the author, of, the author of the Antiquities of Ancient Mexico, many historians and scholarly works of the 16th century concerning the Mexican Indians of Peru mysteriously have been listed as unknown or lost. They started, remember, remember, remember the antiquities that we read from here? This was the same antiquities that said that the Peruvians and Mexicans and Nicaraguans all removed their shoes when they were on holy ground, that they kept the Sabbath, that they were keeping the Levitical law. So they turned around and they tried to erase all of their records so that this way nobody would be able to get this information. Next slide. So now this is Cavalier Bortarini, an Italian by birth. Cavalier Bortarini was a highly esteemed Milanese traveler. And now, on his, it says, so as he crossed the seas with no other view than to study the spot-on history of the native tribes of America, but in transversing the country to examine the monuments and make researches into his antiquities, they had the misfortune to all fall under the suspicion of the Spanish government. After having been deprived of the fruit of his labor, he was sent 1736 as a prisoner of the state of Madrid. The king of Spain declared him innocent, but did not restore him his property and his collection because it proved we were the Israelites. The catalog of which Bortorini published at the end of his essay on the American history of the New Spain lay buried in the archives of the University of Mexico. The valuable relics of Aztec culture were preserved with so little care, they scarcely existed at present an, an eighth of the part of the hieroglyphic records taken from the Italian traveler. Now, mind you, you remember earlier that I told you those stones in Puerto Rico were Hebrew? The Bureau of Ethnology listed them as what? Hieroglyphs. So when you start to see hieroglyphs mentioned of the North American Indians, that's code word for ancient Hebrew. Because ancient Hebrew is classified as what? A pictographical language. A pictographical language is a language described by pictures, a.k.a. hieroglyphs. Next slide. Now, now we get into the whole shebang. This is the home stretch right here. This book right here, because the office of Yahweh Allah, I just found out about this information. And I decided to take him to one of my favorite Mexican spots down in, uh, in Brooklyn, right? And while we were over there, we went and we found a rare bookstore. And when I went in the rare bookstore, right after I just got done telling him about what J.W. Powell did in 1879, the director of the Bureau of Ethnology. Remember what I told you earlier about the Bureau of Ethnology? I don't know if y'all remember. Way early on, I said, remember ethnology. This is literally the Bible 
for archaeologists and anthropologists on how they're supposed to act to data when it comes to the North American Indians. Do you understand? I found this book that day. Found it on the shelf inside there, man. Baraka the Yahawai Yahushua. Give me the next slide. This right here was presented to a library. If you notice, it's directly from the Smithsonian. We ain't even supposed to have this. You open this book, it turns around and says, do not remove from this library. They gave it to the wrong nigga. <laughs> and, yo, and I, I played him so slick. Like I turned around, I was like, I was like, how much is this book? I forget what he wanted. I'm like, yeah, I don't think it's worth more than 80. Like, I'll think about it. I came back later, I came through. I'm like, I'll give it to you. He's like, I'll give it to you for 80. I think he wanted one something. And then he opened it up. He goes, even though this is from the Smithsonian, I'll give it to you for 80. Yo, I ain't even have the money. I spent that shit in two seconds. Give me the next slide. So now, this is the limitations of use of some anthropolitical data by J.W. Powell. This is submitted to the Smithsonian, meaning this set precedent for what everyone was supposed to do. Remember what I said earlier about Alexander Hill Drecker about the uh, Bering Strait. Remember, they indoctrinated everyone to follow that. Well, this is the indoctrination for when it comes down to archaeological evidence concerning the American Indians. This is their Bible. Investigations in this department are of great interest and have attracted to the field a host of works, excuse me, workers. But the general review of the mass published matter exhibits the fact of the use which material has not always been put, excuse me, has not, excuse me, has been put, oh, excuse me, basically what they did has not been wise the way they used it. In the monuments of antiquities found throughout North America, in the camp and village sites, grave mounds, rooms, scattered works of art, the origin and development of the arts in savage and barbaric life may be satisfactorily studied. Incidentally, too, hints of customs may have been discovered, but outside of this, the discoveries may have been illegitimately used especially for the purpose of connecting the tribes of North America with peoples or so-called races of antiquity in other parts of the world. Meaning, if you try to take the North American Indians and say, I found Hebrew writing and these are the lost tribes, illegitimate, you can't use it. This is the law of the Smithsonian. Give me the next slide. Now we're on the next page. So now, remember what we were talking about earlier, right? So it may be said that the Pueblos discovered the southwestern portion of the United States and farther the south through Mexico and perhaps Central American tribes, have, excuse me, having a culture quite far as advanced as exhibited to the discovered rooms. In this respect, then, there is no need to search for an extra lineal origin through lost tribes for any art there exhibited. They turned around and said, you are not allowed to connect us to the lost tribes of Israel. When you read this whole chapter, even when you go down to the mound builders that we were talking about, they keep bringing up. You cannot, once again, with regard to the mounds so widely scattered between the two oceans, it may be said that the mound builders' tribes were known in early history of discovery of the continent and that their vestiges of art covered do not excel any respect of the arts of the Indian tribes known in history. There is therefore no reason for us to search for an extra lineal origin through lost tribes for the arts discovered in the mounds of North America. They made it illegal for us to connect ourselves to the lost tribes. And that's why you won't be taught this in history. That's, right. that's why we don't know this. Right. I'm gonna give you one more. Give me the next slide. Picture writing. Remember how they said that we don't have any written language? It's because they destroyed it all. They burned it all. They kept it all away from us. Or remember, you know what chapter this is in? The limitations of anthropolitical data concerning the Indians. Right. Well, let's read a little bit. You should have never taught us how to read. 
The pictographs of the North American Indians were made on diverse substances, the bark of trees, tablets of wood, deer skins, animals, and surfaces of rocks. So it's us talking about all these things that they made. So now, when it comes down to it, right, it's us talking about we expect to find many pictographs. Many of these pictographs are simple pictures, rude sketchings, or patences. Hold up. Boom, boom, boom. Let me, let me just fast forward to the part where they start killing it. You understand? But it has, hold on, what the hell is it? It's a lot here, y'all. I'm trying to just fast forward straight to the part. All right, basically, I'm going to just fast forward to the part. Y'all can read this later. If they found the pictographical language, it was illegitimate. So what's Hebrew? A pictographical language. That's why we have no language. That's the last chapter. Where down here? Hence, it will be seen that it is illegitimate. Boom! Keep going, Zaha Zaha, a hand. <laughs> Hence, it will be seen that it was it is illegitimate to use any pictographical matter of data to the discovery of the continent of Columbus. The, it meaning that it is all illegitimate if we want to use it. They will not allow us to retrieve our history. Right. Next slide. Boom, drops mic. That's it. All right. Um, what time is it? 9.25. We got a couple of minutes. Any Q&A? Any questions? Did you hit the lights? Bump shot. Let me hit this scotch, will you? Like you sir. Early on, when you was... Um... Could you uh, swing on the mic so they can hear him at home? You just hit the button so that's on. Boy, I made the deal. You did uh, right. Give me a hand. <laughs> so like you said, early on, you um, you was they were showing the the pictures of of the mounds, I guess that they that they had made when they had the the oil well and they had the menorah. Right. Why did they have nine? I mean, we always made different amounts of candlesticks. You know what I'm saying? I was just in the design. Okay. You know what I'm saying? But the point is, is that it was a menorah. Okay. The point is that it was an oil lamp. And it was made to look like it was spilling into the the oil lamp, okay. into into the into the vessel. Okay. Oh, um, okay. Um, did, so the Spanish uh fabricated that story that when they uh, uh when Hernan Cortez came to the Americas to Mexico, uh, that the Aztecs were um sacrificing people and uh, dress uh half butt naked. They were fabricating a lot of it. Now, I'm not going to say that we didn't sacrifice people because when you read the scriptures, it says we passed our children to the fires of Moloch. So for me to turn around and say that they didn't know, but if you go and you look at certain things, like you'll find huge mountains of skulls, right, found inside the Americas, they blame us for that. But you go and you look in history, you find giant mounds of buffalo heads that are stacked that the white man did. We know the difference between what they did and what they didn't. Listen, the very fact that we sinned is the fact that we were conquered. Right. So is it possible that some of us might have done some human sacrifice or a.k.a. murder? Yeah, absolutely. You understand? Which is why a white man was able to come conquer us. But as far as to the extent that they say, it was propaganda. And when you go and you look at how we were dressing, did any of y'all see loincloths? Y'all saw garments, you understand, prestigious wear. You saw meat trees and turbans, and you understand, so on and so forth, because that was our culture. Anything else? Oh, so 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 that was never true that the Indians were. No, no, they lie on us. <laughs> Any other questions? I got it. Right here. Um, the, 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 what was the name of the book where um it was saying that the white man brought this book, but we already had this book. Okay, that's from a couple of sources. Um, that's not only for just uh, when you point the mic, don't point it to the speaker. You'll, you'll get a feedback. Um, that's from a couple of sources. That's one of them is from uh, the, the Ten Lost Tribes, but he got that from Ethan Smith's The Star in the West. So when you go and you research that, it'll give you more. Like they said that a couple of times, and it's in a couple of different books that they gave us our own book back. Any other questions? Um. I hear a lot of people saying that the Native American Indians are the indigenous population of North, Central, and South America never had horses before the Spaniards came. Is that true? No, that's a lie. We brought horses over here. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. So if you, if you could, could you give me a source like so I could, you know, kind of... Okay, I, 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 
I can't give you one that I have here right now. Let me go back into the archives. I'll give it to you. But even General General Hyman taught that from the rip. You know what I'm saying? Like, we brought them here. The only thing that they brought over here besides, like, rape, murder, pillaging, plunder, and, and swine. Like, pigs were not indigenous to this area. Rats either. Yeah, rats either. And now, now the New York subway is filled with them. I'm over there working at 100 Van Dam, ducking and dodging rats. <laughs> Yeah. Um, the the Apalachee, right? The the Seminole Indians, right? Is is there is there a relation between, or oh, what is the reason why the Appalachian Mountains up here in the northeast also is wow. named after Appalachian? Wow. Okay, that uh, that I didn't get into research, but a lot of that stuff was Indian names that they named. Right. You get what I'm saying? Like, and what you're gonna see is that there's certain things, like for example, Hibaro, you get or Hibaro is the real pronunciation of it. That's what they called the Tainos who fled into the mountains in order to hide from the Spanish. Hebrew, if you go and you remove the, dre, the J, you understand, which didn't even exist, it's Ibero. If you go and you remove the S, which makes it plural, and then the O, which makes it masculine in Spanish, you have Ibar, which is Hebrew, which is why they kept saying that the Indians of the islands are Hebrews. They were calling us Hibaros. They were calling us Hibaros. They were calling us Hebrews. But once again, it, they weren't saying Ibar. They were saying it with their tongue. So most of the stuff like Appalachian and all that is bastardized pronunciations from the so-called white man. So when you go to certain Indian towns like Okeechobee and all these other lands, that's not really what we called it. That's how they pronounced it. So... Can we 100% know for sure? No, but we can see inside the verb the similarities between Hebrew, even if it's been bastardized. My man right here. The stones earlier on that had the Hebrew writing on them. From Puerto, Puerto Rico? Kind of. Were those like destroyed artifacts or were those stones made the way that they were and, and designed the way they were? No, no, no th th those were intact. And because they had so many of them and they were preserved. And even down to the point where uh, the father Nazario, that's what they called him, he kept them. The Smithsonian tried to buy them, and when he wouldn't sell them to him, they tried deeming them as fake. But the problem was is that they weren't able to find the match with any rocks that was on Puerto Rico. You know what I'm saying? And once again, like when you go and you look at the artifacts, what the hell is it saying Hanoa for? You understand? Because that's the tribe of Ephraim. So those are still intact. You know what I'm saying? Like, like there's too many artifacts found all throughout the Americas tracing us back to our Hebrew lineage for it to be coincidence. There's too many artifacts for us to turn around and say, oh, no, these are all, are they all fakes? Like, never mind the Michigan tablets that they found 33,000 stones for. They deem those as fakes. I didn't pull them in here. The, every single artifact that I pulled, even white scholars agree you can't deny it. And no, and now imagine the ones they are denying. Imagine what they got locked in a damn bunker somewhere. Imagine what they burned. We just read what they burned, what they destroyed. Imagine what we ain't seen yet. But this is why the Lord said what? That the earth shall help the woman and swallow up all that flood of lies that the dragon gave us, which is the so-called white man. That's right. right. Christ. Any other questions? Going once. Going twice. All right, so listen, listen, uh, a couple of things. We got Cross the Line coming on next. You know what I'm saying? We're going to take a quick break. Make sure y'all cop some oils from Captain Nazaria. If y'all want some of the music, come see me. You know what I'm saying? Come support. And, yo, that concludes the lecture. Right. Right. Hey, let me get my same crew. Let me get my same crew that help me, uh, that help me set this up. Let me get my same crew that help me set this up. Report to me right here. And let me get my same crew, my same crew, ASAP, ASAP. Okay, hey, listen, if, if you, if, listen, if you was in the crew to help me set this up, I need you to be right back here. Need you to be right back here.
I, I got to get the password. Get the password. Get the live You know how to cut the live stream? Okay. Here, I'm going to take the damn camera. Hey, if y'all want to stay for front of the live radio,